expert to be able to assist in and support them. And, and when they went through, we did like a, a meeting with Imagine Learning, and they said, well, we'll just do a sample. They said, let's jump on and let's come up with it. Now, mind you, the teachers didn't know we were going to reach out. So the sales rep said, let me find somebody that, that is able to help. So she clicked. Within, I'm talking 30 seconds, there was a teacher online. What are you having trouble with? We explained what, where the issue was. I think it was something with fractions. And then the teacher went on to explain, shared her screen, described the steps. And I mean, it was maybe a minute and a half of, of instruction. We asked a few questions, and then the teacher exited. It was a great, great piece that they were able to provide. But I think as we look moving forward, this is the kind of support systems we're going to need, which is this virtual support to our teachers and students. And it can be utilized at home as well. So students can have access to a live certified teacher at night if they're working on the program. And you know, that's what I, I really hope that we can do once we do bring this in is encourage teachers but also students to utilize um, you know the resource. I think one of the best math lessons I saw at one of the workshops we went to was a math class that had surrounding whiteboards and the children were never in their seat. They were at the whiteboard mm -hmm. doing their math and helping people that were on both sides of them with their math problems and then the whole class reviewed every one of the whiteboards. Um, and so maybe something like that would help in our math classes too. Whiteboards are cheap. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion and a second. Do we have any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Attorney Legal Matters. Nothing at this time. Thank you. Any other business that needs to come before the school board? Mr. Mullen. Mr. Bishop. No, ma'am. Ms. Powers. Uh, my only thing is happy Tuesday, 22 Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is a Tuesday. So this is a Tuesday. That's ties in our math lesson. All right. Very good. All right. We're going to adjourn and we're going to open the workshop. I don't give me a adjourn. I just want to tell y'all. Um, since you said that, I was at the gym this morning and the trainer said, happy Tuesday. I said, well, I'm going to send that out to 2200 employees, see how they respond. I'll let her know. But um, I'll be on a one o'clock call today with FADS and um, other superintendents because we're trying to convince the legislators and give them some talking points on why we don't need a separate financial class, financial literacy. So we're asking them to give us a list of what needs to be taught in the economics class that we're already doing. We may still be meeting all their needs, so we're trying to get where they don't mandate a complete course for half a semester, but give us the talking points within that class. So if we can meet those needs, to have a kind of a conference. And I told them when I was running back in 16, they, they well, the kids can't write a check. And I said, well, we have business academies in every one of our high schools, and they teach accounting. And if you need that, make accounting a required graduation plan. So I know you're right. We have that instruction. We just have to make sure that the kids Well, two of the things that are on the list currently is to balance your checkbook and inheritance. We'll teach them about inheritance. So we're coming back and saying, give us a list of what to include in those courses, and we'll make sure they're met. So just to help out. Thank you. Okay, we're going to adjourn the workshop, and we're going to open up the meeting and open the workshop. Yeah, we're going to adjourn the meeting. We're going to open the workshop. Thank you, Thomas. No worries. <laughs> you do it for me, so. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh. Good morning again. A few weeks ago, the board asked us to bring back information on where our current status with substitute teachers and some ideas of where to go next. So we are going to present that this morning. Here are is uh, the numbers for the substitute teachers that we've hired by month, starting with September through January. And we have to note that 40% of the 72 substitutes that we've hired have already been hired in the school district for various positions, whether it be teachers or support. These are the current substitute pay rates. We, have, we put this into place 
at July 1st of 2021 due to the increase in minimum wage to $10 an hour. This is how we compare to surrounding counties. Our current pay rate, you will see Citrus in the gray. We have compared it to Marion, Hernandez, Sumter, Levy, and Pasco. The two that are start are currently being serviced by Kelly Services, which is a third party company that come in, comes in and handles the whole substitute process. But their fee, when we met with them a few years ago, is about 35%. So you would pay $35 on every $100 that we pay our substitutes. We also compared ourselves, our fill rate to other districts. We have done this every year for the past several years. Our fill rate previously, pre-COVID, was about 90% or higher every single day. We are now averaging about 60% on average overall this school year. Other districts are between 60 and 70%. So even those with Kelly services, Kelly, you know, states that they will have 90%, they are still around that 60 to 70% um, mark as well. So, um, sorry if I interrupt, Swain. So the, the asterisks here though, and I'm just trying to get a feel for how much these other counties are actually paying, right? So in Hernando County, um, the asterisk is a high school, or let's go to a, um, let's go to a bachelor's degree, $100. They have the asterisk, and then they're adding another 35% onto that. Yes, so they're sir. actually paying $135. A mm -hmm. day per set. Is yes, that right? Sir. And yet Marion County is like us. They don't have this external service, but they're paying $100. So literally it's costing, they're, they're putting $100 in, whereas Hernando and Pasco, you got to add basically 35% to You that. are correct. Okay. So with that, I mean, Marion's paying more, Hernando obviously paying more, even more if they did it on their own, but you got Pasco's up there. So really what we're comparing to is pretty much Sumter and, Le and Levy counties. I mean, I mean, when I look at the numbers, our, our, our pay compares more to theirs. You are correct. Yeah. Okay. There's a, is there a difference in recruiting substitutes being paid things based on their degrees, where Hernando and, um, well, Sumter and Levy, they're all the same. Marion County, $100 for everybody, whether you're a high school grad or a master's degree. I can tell you, we do have the various rates of pay, but oftentimes when they come to us with a bachelor's degree, we recruit them for teaching. Yes. Especially if they come with a certificate. Yeah. So, but we do, you are correct, we do pay various rates based on your level of degree as well as if you hold a current certification. The 11, the long term 11, uh, $100 and 11, $111 plus depending on your ed, does that then go up based on, is that starting at the high school grad level of $111? Yes. So, and that starts after 10 days or is that a, what is defined as long term? Ten days. It, okay, that's yes. what I thought. You have to work ten days. Once you, if you, if anyone takes, let's say, they go on vacation for a week, we have a substitute. They have to start over. We do allow some exceptions, especially if they've subbed in a long term position and then are going to another long term position. Schools will email us and ask us for exceptions. But yes, they have to sub continually at that rate. We pay them at the short term rate, and then. When they said that 10 days, we retro them back that those monies. Um, and that's 10 days in the same classroom, that's not necessarily correct. that they've done 10 days in a row. Correct. The, has, on the fill rate, has there been um, any looking at whether Mondays and Fridays? We're going to look at that next, and I can show okay. you. Not, not necessarily the, the dates, but I can show you when teachers put their time in. Great, thank you. Okay. So with regards to our substitute teacher program, as I shared a few weeks ago, 
we have hired Nancy Weaver. She is our program specialist in HR. And 50, I would say at least 50% of her job is recruiting, interviewing, hiring, and supporting our new substitutes. And here is several bulleted items of things that we have changed or continue to put in place to recruit and maintain our substitutes. And these include, she interviews, she calls references, she, from the start, she is building those relationships with our substitutes. She um, supports them the entire way. We've also had her go out with some of our substitutes that have not been trained to be in a classroom with classroom management. She's gone out and supported and worked with those substitutes throughout the day in the classroom to support that. So she is their contact. Where we've not necessarily had one person before, she is now the contact for the substitutes, for all of our substitutes. She sends them encouraging emails throughout the month um, and, and, and reminds them, if you have any questions, concerns, please let us know, and we'll be there to support you. When did they do their substitute survey? Pardon? They have the last item on that through the screen is substitute survey. When did they do that? We, we did that a few weeks ago. We, we asked them just if there's any concerns, anything we need to improve, and I'm gonna share that with you. Okay. Yes. Here's the absences. This is, uh, Mr. Kennedy, this is sort of what you're referring to. This is our bill notice. Out of the 3,546 absences so far this year, 670 were given less than one hour notice to find a substitute. And then you can see the one to six hours, the six to 24, 24 to 28, and then the two day notice. I'm assuming the 670 means they woke up and are sick. And are sick, correct. Um, or something correct. You know, tragic happens. So did you, and, and my question then would be added, have we looked at this? I know some districts have looked at it on a weekday basis of what days are harder to fill than others. We find, we have pulled that data. Mr. Bishop has asked us to track it every day and share that with him, and we do do that. We find the same things Mondays, Fridays. If there's a holiday on that Monday, we find that Fridays are harder to fill. That's why we went to the Ed Services team and Dr. Hebert and asked them to, and Lindy, to avoid those Monday, Fridays for trainings because we do find that a lot of our staff do take off Mondays and Fridays for, for various reasons. We do see that. So I do see that there is, um, sometimes there are districts that are then looking at offering substitutes a premium if they'll work on the Monday or the Friday and that, to try and combat that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if we haven't looked at that, if maybe we, you know, I know we probably are gonna be looking at other things, but that, that may also be another way of trying to get the that 60% up. And we can certainly discuss that absolutely and look at that as well. We are open to any and all ideas, absolutely. Here is our proposed substitute teacher pay increase, and I will show you the figures after we look at this chart would be to increase $20 per hour. I mean, I'm pit per hour, I'm sorry, $20 per day. 20, I did not, I apologize for that. $20 per day increase. So, so non-degree to associate degrees would go from 75 to 95 a day, and then bachelor's 80 to 100 a day and throughout. Next, and this would be proposed for July 1st, unless the board gives a different direction, we would propose it and put it in next year's budget starting July 1st, because as I'm going to show you in our next slide, our minimum wage is gonna to change to $11, and we will begin that change on July 1st for our support substitutes. Here are the numbers. So we pulled, we did not pull during COVID because our, we pulled a few, a year before COVID, so we pulled, I believe three years ago, the number of days. We had 8,870 sub days. And we know that's gonna vary from year to year. We know that, but it's pretty consistent, pretty average. If we paid them at 95 a day, the, the increase, not, the benefits are very minimal for substitutes. It would be roughly $177,400 to increase from $20 a day to make us at 95 the starting pay for substitutes a day. 
this would average, right now, we pay our substitutes for seven and a half hours a day if we increase because we know that schools could use substitutes eight hours a day to help with those morning duties, those afternoon duties. So if we increase the amount of time they work each day to eight hours, we would be paying $11.88 per hour for eight hour days. We also wanted to look how does that impact what we pay our paraprofessionals. And our paraprofessionals will be paid right currently, they are being paid $12.64 an hour. So it is less than our paraprofessionals who've been hired on. Our, we know that support substitutes, we are gonna have to go to that $11 an hour next year. If we had 3,283 days, so the cost would be roughly $26,000 to increase that. And it would be an $8 a day increase. The other piece is we are gonna have to go to $11 an hour next year anyway, so it's only, it's 88 cents more an hour if we go to the $95 a day. We would have to increase it to 83 next year for short-term daily substitutes, so we are looking at the $95. So you're, you're talking about increasing the pay Correct. from 80 to 100 for a bachelor's degree, but you're also gonna increase the time by a half hour. Correct. We don't, I mean, we can look at not increasing that time. We would, if we decrease that time, we would be paying more than we would pay a paraprofessional. So we need to look at that as well. I don't know. I, I think if we do our teachers at 7.5 hours, I don't see the need to increase the substitute to 8 hours. I don't think I'd ever I don't that. Um, no, we can do because seven or five, five we're just going to pay them the teachers. So you don't want them sitting around doing nothing for another half hour because the, the pay is not that much. So I, I'd rather keep the hours consistent with what we do with our teachers. Um, so another question I have on the the like FICA workers comp, what all is covered? What does the district, what is the total cost of the district on, on those? I would have to ask Stacy. It's very, it's very minimal, but I will, Brendan, will you check with her? Brendan will check and let us know. It's very minimal compared to an employee, the cost for benefits. Okay. But he will let us know. The other piece is uh, the board asked us to survey the substitutes and again the overwhelming response was increase in pay. That was the overwhelming response for substitutes. And then sometimes we just need part-time uh, substitutes. For instance, if, if Tom and I were going to a swim meet, we might not be leaving until 11 o'clock in the morning and we only need coverage for two periods in the afternoon. Um, we still allowing for that? For part-time? Yeah. Right now, if they need a half day sub, we have been, because substitutes don't want to come for just a half a day we, where it's impossible, so we've been hiring them for the full day and then having them cover other places. The teachers can still put in that time. We've just been having them, because the needs are so great, cover other areas throughout the day. So part-time was yes. a problem. So right now, we will have to, as of July 1st, we will have to increase the substitute rate to $83 to meet minimum wage for that seven and a half hours a day. If we want to look at increasing it more than that, than that $83, we just need direction from the board. Yeah, what's the date again on that that we have that? It's, it's September, but we start at July 1st just for payroll purposes, and that's when our new year begins. Susie, you said that we're running at what percentage rate right now of of being able to fill subs on a daily Around basis. Around 60%. An and average. what do we budget typically for? How many do we budget? We budget for the full amount, Tammy? Yes. So I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm asking is, it sounds then like we would have the, the budget in there to increase it at, let's say, the next board meeting. Would we not? Because we, we're underutilizing the budget for this current year, so while we didn't budget for it, we've underutilized the budget. So I wouldn't think there would be a budget shortfall. That's, that's a very good and if point. that's the case, then I would suggest that we need to give our teachers some relief. And if we can, if we can make that happen, I, I would be certainly open to that happening. So when we budget, 
we budget for the the um, one hour call thing. That's really the only thing we have to budget. Like if Susie was a teacher and she's she, her position, she leaves. We use the budget for her salary to pay for that sub. So we've already got the budget for the teacher in there, and we're definitely not going to be paying the sub forty-seven five. So that budget's in there. The only thing that we really budget above and beyond the typical salary is that day-to-day -day sub, and that's definitely um, we have so many open positions. We definitely have some leeway in that so, budget this year to. Leave. So you know, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but I would be certainly saying I think we need to get some relief as soon as we can. Hey, I I'm all for that. Um, you know, the sixty percent fill rate. I mean, I, I can't tell you the times my son has said they've had a you know they don't have subs, so they've had to put classes together. They all go and sit all together, and you know, not much gets done. And so I I think we've got to get. We've got to get some more subs out there. I'm ready to move on it. Thomas, I like your idea of the the Monday, Friday. Um, you know, if we could look at something at a premium, I like the idea of setting up something that after five times subbing, you get a, a your badge gets you to the sporting events for free, just like our employees do. I'm, I'm for that. I think that's. I think we have to keep incentivizing everywhere we can. Um, for our substitutes, we, we're so appreciative of them. I, I know my wife, you know, will regularly send me a text. Uh, I'm losing my planning again because of that. Yeah. You know, the impact of that, and that means they're covering that classroom. Um, I, I'm very appreciative of, of all they're doing. It, it's it is greater now. It, it's greater now than than probably ever because we are at a 60 percent instead of a 90 percent. Uh, rate. So I, I think we want to do everything within our abilities to, to make an improvement. And then the other things to do you can think of, um, not for this year, uh, the next year, but the calendar committee always tries to determine days and longer weekends for every month that they're working. Um, if, if you have some input with uh, the days that subs are especially needed, don't pick the Monday after Super Bowl. That's come up every year so far, and it's been down. But um, if the calendar committee can help you in any more with the Mondays and the Fridays, we can, we can try and do that too. Thank you. I just want to add in on this. You know this is not a Citrus County issue because if the public's watching, you know they're going to say it's just because of Citrus County. Um, I talked to several superintendents last week. They have taken their art, music, PE teachers, pulled them out of their classes. They are now in the, uh, academic classrooms and they're just consolidating special classes. They're taking kids, like you said, they're putting them in gymnasiums, they're trying to do that. So it's not just Citrus County, it's a statewide issue because we've seen a double um, absences in our teachers, our students, we can't get subs. <coughs> so I know you know that, I just want the public to know that this is a statewide nationwide issue. And um, we're dealing with this minimum wage. It's going to go up a dollar every year until we hit until it's fifteen dollars. Is that's correct? That is correct. Okay. And I know what you're trying to do is you're trying to make it fair for those other people who work in, in the district, um, you know, and, and put it in perspective. So that's why you went to the eight hours maybe is to make the hourly rate less than what they're making because you want it to be fair. What are the should, what are the budget numbers? I mean, I would be interested rather than be, meeting the bare minimums every time. Could we jump to twelve dollars on the minimum wage? You know, what I'd like to see kind of some of those projections. Um, you know, because we by law we got to go to eleven dollars, but we know we're going to be going a dollar every want Could could we jump considering the, the position we're in? Could we jump it to twelve? in this year and then get to the fifteen dollars earlier or what are our options there? We we still gotta remember we've got our paras and our teachers aides and I think that's something that you've you've been talking about too. All right. And we we do, you know, our paras and our teachers aides also do get additional benefits, health benefits, um, and factors, but we are running close to that situation of, you know, does somebody say I'll be a substitute instead of a pair. That's a concern. So I mean, we, it, it's a. I, I do think it's a tiered situation we have to look at here. Well, the substitutes don't get health benefits, though, correct? 
No, that's what I'm saying. That, but but that, pairs, that is, but but right. the pairs do. So you're saying that. that the, but the pairs right. hourly weight. I think you're as as you're saying that it's getting up into that same. And if we're saying we're going to pay the daily rate more, but require less hours of them, or, or require the hour the same hours as the pairs of the teachers, we're we're also going to be changing that number. I think as well. If we, as Ms. Townsend stated, and several of the board members have stated, if we continue at the seven and a half hours a day and increase it to 12 a day, that would be $90. So we could look at that, at doing that right now, if that's a recommendation of the board. You mean not to go to the 100, go to, go to 90? What, I didn't follow Go to 90, instead of the 95, we would go to 90. So let me go back. Yeah, to go, that go back to that slide if you would real quick. So we would go to 90, starting with nine non-degree, and then add. We would add essentially 15. So we go non-degree 90, bachelor's 100, and FDLE a certified teacher 105. We would then go to 90, 95, and then 100. Oh yeah, I'm I'm not in favor of that. I, I want to see us hit the hundred dollar mark to be competitive and. I don't know if you have Was your 9,500 based on an eight hour day though? Yes. So if, if you go back to seven and a half, that's where the decrease is. Yeah, I think we should stay seven and a half, and I think we seven should. Seven and a half and still increase. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, I just want to clarify that. But then <laughs> when we do that, we're going back to that question of, are we going? Are we talking about then paying a substitute the same as a para? We would be paying that. Um, and that's that. that. I was just going to say. I think we. But that's but, what you're saying. But then that comes back to what you said. The paras get health benefits. These don't come with health benefits. And, and I agree with that. But I so, I don't know that that. You know, paras. I think would argue um, that they are doing a lot behind the scenes. That they are doing are are essential. They are committing to that job on a on a daily basis for um, right that's why i said let's raise the pairs to twelve dollars an hour instead of eleven well the pairs the pair is already the starting pay for the pairs are at twelve dollars and sixty four cents well then how then why if we're going to 1188 that's based on eight hours what's the based on seven and a half hours what's the pay rate based on seven and a half hours So if we do the 95, if we go to no. 95 a day? No, the 100. You, I have it at 95 right now for the non-degree. It's $12.60. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. An hour. Or 1267. You are correct. 1267. Which would put us higher than the Paris. Correct. I think, you know, while I, I, I don't disagree, Mr. Dodd, with what you're saying as far as wanting to keep all of it um, at the proposed amount, I think if we're talking about doing it today or, you know, asking the board to come back to us, perhaps the, the, the you know, the option that we have to escalate, you know, to, uh, to move this forward more immediate this school year would be to then go to ninety dollars per day for uh, the non-degree, the the ninety-five for the bachelor, and the hundred for the certified, um, and then we could then come back this summer, as you're talking about, which was your initial proposal, and that would then and then keep everyone at the seven, the seven and a half hours a day. But that means that the hourly rate compensation would still be to increase them above what they're getting now, but it would allow us to then have that conversation about the pairs and the impact of the pairs going into the summer. Is that okay? That's that's an option. Let me throw out one other option. No. Yeah. What if we went with ninety for non-degree, mm -hmm. a hundred for bachelor's degree, and hundred and ten for FDLA certified? I mean. 
I just got there can't that. be that many that's certified teachers, but you know, why not give them even more if they're a certified teacher than a, a bachelor's degree person that's non certified? I certainly can go along with that. I don't know how the rest of you all I mean I, that would that would address the the parrot concern. Does that Susie, is that are you with us on that? Yes, absolutely. Superintendent, do you see anything on okay. I think that's a great way of doing it. And Mr. Dodd, you had asked regarding our benefits. They're, they're approximately 2% for short-term daily subs is what we pay is about 2%. Okay, but isn't FICA, isn't FICA more than, is? Not for subs. Not for subs. Yes. They need the bank. The yes, they, bank. They, they, their, their money goes into an account and when they stop substituting, they are able to, they are able to cash out that money. Okay. So it doesn't provide any more help, it just provides Correct. Uh, Correct. But the Social Security, but what comes out of the paycheck though, is there, there's got to be coverage for like workers' comp in there too, right? 0. 0.63. Okay. And, and the then five. here's 1.45. Now, as we move on to long-term subs, Social Security will come out for long-term subs, but this is just daily short-term sub, right? Is it is two percent, roughly two percent? So, but if, if they does the so we're not giving we're not putting anything into the to the bank code. The 1.45. Yes. Because wasn't that one of your questions you asked on the survey? Something about about benefits, about help, about retirement benefits, or something. That's for long term. We have ASRS and long term. Once they have sub so many days, we're required to pay ASRS. Am I correct? You are correct. Right. But so if they serve, if they if they are in a long term sub position seven or more months and plan to be, then we then we contribute to FRS. And then they would have the 10.82% for FRS. So I'd have to go back and look at the survey. Uh, Nancy and I worked on that together, and Brendan, so we'd have to go back and look at your benefits. Because we just couldn't automatically increase that. Right, I mean, I just thought, I mean, the survey I thought was, I thought it was something on the survey that dealt Okay, we'll go back and look at that. But that wasn't the number one response, because you surveyed the substitute teachers, correct? We did, correct. The number one response was um, more money. How many, an increase how, in many number, how many number, how many participants did you survey, do you know? Do you remember, Brian? Yeah. He's checking it. Okay. But the number one was more pay. Correct. I'd like to say that I appreciate all the hard work you've put into this, and I know it hasn't been easy. But we want more money for ourselves. Thank you. 262 active substitute teachers were surveyed and 162 responded. Okay, that's a good number. So I hear the direction of the board to look at bringing back before the board at the next board meeting an increase of $90 for non degree. $100 for a bachelor's degree, certified 105. Looking at the long-term rates that I have on the screen, are we still looking at increasing them by $20 right now or by 15? Because the short-term non-degree would be by 15, the rest would be by, actually certified would actually be by now $25 increase. Mm -hmm. now, so are we looking at increasing the long-term by 15, 20, or 25? What would be the direction of the board for our long term? Well, isn't that, isn't the long term, I thought previously, is it depends on your, uh, what your degree level is. Correct, and right now, on, according to the chart, <laughs> we propose $20 increase. But that's July 1st, right? That would be July 1st. But we could do it we could do it now. Correct. So if we want to increase the long term $20, okay. we can stay with that. 
So the short term was going to be 90, 100, and 110. Short Correct. Term. And the long term is basically right now was at twenty dollars. Was it? It would be twenty dollars less than what you see on the screen, and we can go back to that. Could you not do though? I think the bachelor was twenty. <laughs> the certified you said was twenty five. Yes. Sir. But I forget what the non degree. Fifteen. Is. So is there a reason we couldn't still do those same increments on the long term? We could, yes. That's what I think. We could I, do I think for that's just, degree, we could do 15 dots. Let's just do, let's, okay. let's follow the same suit. Yeah. Any other questions or input? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So what's our recruiting plan to get more um, subs? I mean, we, we found through recruiting when we have another job fair, so Nancy will be there to recruit in March. Uh, but we found that when we recruited, and we're recruiting for actually substitutes and employees, that we found in this fall, that we found this, when we surveyed everyone that came in, the biggest recruiting tool was social media. So we have talked, there was no one that came from the radio, there was no one that came from the newspapers, it was social media and word of mouth. So we will promote it throughout our current staff and we will promote it on social media. Mrs. Blair and Brendan and I and Nancy have discussed how to make it more visible on Facebook and the, the costs and those associated with those. So that's our plan. And one of the questions that I was asked is, you know, we talked a little bit about the training. How do we get subs up to speed? Because there's a lot they have to know, right? Mm -hmm. It's safety and security. Even. You know, are we, we're not paying them for any of that, uh, that part of it, right? I mean, when they, the kid, can you kind of cover that? In the That's correct. We did do, um, previously, up until this year, we had done where they did training online. And now they either have face to face with Nancy or depending on the circumstances, Zoom trainings. And she does face to face trainings with them to train them on safety and security. We have put together a PowerPoint to focus on classroom management and everything you need to know with regards to this stuff. They still do Alice training online, but she also does safety and security training in her substitute training. But we're not paying them for that training, are we? That is correct. Okay. We but, are reimbursing them. Right. Another, as we say, a, a perk is we reimburse them. So if they said it's 25 days, correct? 25 days, once they set, hit that 25 day mark substitute first, we reimburse them the drug and fingerprinting fees. Right. And that would, I mean, the question would be, because um, the, fee, the, the fees right now are running, I didn't know, but. I wanted to say it was seventy five to hundred dollars. It's about ninety. It's, about 90. Yeah, okay. so it's closer to hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, that they would get that then after they put in twenty five days. Yes, sir. Yeah. We could lower that. But I was just going to say that. Well, there's two parts. We yeah. could one lower that as days, but then the question would be is how many hours is the training right now equivalent to to become a self? It used to be I would think it was two. Four hours, four to six hours. For the training. Yes. Okay, between Alice and... I know the Alice is probably about an hour, and then Nancy's about an hour as well. Okay, so about two hours. So, I mean, it, that could be included as a part of that if you, you know, if you were looking at trying to compensate them for that time, if they put in, you know, 15 days and include not just the drug screening, but also that training time. I guess... The question on the HR would be: Can we legal? Is that legal to reimburse someone for hours worked? I mean, can, can we make them do the training and not pay them? I guess is the question. Is that, wouldn't that be a legal question, Mr. Bradshaw? I think right. we've already hired them, but we got to pay. Them. They have not been yeah, hired not yet. Been hired they're still, they're, right. They have not been hired yet. So if we, as long as we continue to do it before they're hired, then we could. Pay it for them later as a benefit, as a then I think we can do it right as an incentive, right as an incentive. Yeah. So that could be something to look at. But I, I certainly would be open to lowering the the, the days. Um, I'm not sure what that sweet spot would be, and that may be something you all can look at the data on and see if there's a instead of it you know being in the 20s, maybe yeah. it's in the teens. We can look at that how many of the 15, the 10, 15, 20. Yeah, absolutely. And then Susie, I had um, the SAC meetings at my two elementary schools um, 
and the substitutes were being discussed, and the, the feeling from the parents that were involved in the SAC meetings was they were they were uncomfortable going just as a substitute for Citrus County Schools, but they felt very comfortable substituting in their child's school. So maybe on that parents' night or literacy night that our schools hold, especially the elementary schools, we might have one little booth just to maybe hospitalize those parents uh, and family to come in and substitute just in that school. That's what they wanted. They didn't want to pick up anything online and pick up another school that they weren't familiar with, but they were more than willing to come and help and sub in their children's school. And we will have Nancy, we will reach out to the schools, and Nancy can certainly kind of set up a little table yeah. at their parents' night and talk to parents about the substituting process. You yeah. can certainly do that. Because some of the some of the mothers that are home are all the kids are in school, so they're just waiting to drop them off and pick them up. So they would come in and work. And I know that you had asked me about that too. Do they have to sub at every school? The answer is no. They can just sub at Floral City Elementary or Citrus High School or Chris River Middle School. They can certainly do that. And Ms. Swain, that you know, maybe along those same lines is we know that social media has been our, our biggest thing, but maybe specializing that that call out for subs. I mean, I know we, we put it on the district and we think that parents can see maybe the district, but maybe instead of it being, oh, Hernando Elementary is looking for subs. And that may that may be that branding way. Yeah, I would just do in person stuff. And yeah, no, just be stuff. well because that that I think <laughs> is having positive you know impact. We can we will speak yeah. with the principals regarding that a call out from them. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And then I am interested in Mr. Kennedy's comment about the premium. Um, is that, I mean, you've heard that other districts have stepped up. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's something done by other districts, um, you know, for that very reason, like to, to meet the needs of that Monday, Friday situation that we just, it, it's just an inevitable. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's, this is already going in the step in that right direction, I believe, and I you know, maybe that's something we evaluate and have you guys look at. What is our Monday? Yeah, I, I, I like situation. that. I also like the idea of the, you know, when they get to go to an event like the teacher does. Um, you know, how how could we? Yeah, I've that? I've been talking about that too. I just, I mean, I do think that is a a, a great perk, and I know Mr. Bishop would probably tell me I'm looking for him over there that uh, it impacts gate sales. I mean, we do know that, and I'm not saying that that's not something that is not having to get budgeted in, uh, but I do think that that small perk, I mean, I know people that proudly, you know, use that, that ID to be able to access. Attach that perk to the number of days. The number of days. Just like they're gonna exactly. reimburse their cost of uh, fees. How many days do they yeah, have to substitute to get a pass? Yep. And I will speak with Mr. Bishop about that. We think of the weekends, but many of the employees pay a Saturday and Sunday bonus to work in our, our businesses here in Citrus County. Um, they make a little bit more, so it's sad to say that we have to reimburse our subs because our teachers take off Mondays and Fridays, but I understand. Okay. So I have some direction and we will bring that. Yes, Ms. Thomas. Uh, the sub's going to be a long term sub. Do you know at that time or just at the usual? Yes, ma'am. Normally, most of the, a lot of the time, I want to say we know ahead of time if we have an opening and they're going through the process of posting that position and looking to hire, or if we know a teacher's going to be out on maternity leave or surgery, they're going to be out for at least 30 days, we know that information. Not always, because we do have teachers that are that get sick and are out for that 10 days, but a lot of times, yes, ma'am, we know ahead of time, and the, the um, substitute person at each school, uh, the coordinator, will will check with them and let us know ahead of time if they're going to be a long-term staff. Yes? And uh, the teacher that is certified is certified that is correct if you're certified that is the that is the pay that they receive based for certification yes 
and they have a right to choose if they see a math class or a reading class or a social studies class, they have the right to choose to pick up that class for that day. All right, thank you very much and we will we will bring this back to the next board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. School support services. Mr. Dixon. It says Johnny Bishop, but I'm looking to see who we. <laughs> Actually, going to be my my conversation with the board is 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 that so if we were going to give you all the power it, it, no 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 it's just I mean because that that yes I think that that's appropriate. Well, it would have to be directional by the board. So you have to vote to do it. So and um, when when we spoke uh, in reference to this as far as the. The changing that we also talked about who then gets to appoint the committee members and I guess if we say um, it says the duties of such committee shall be outlined at the time of appointment uh, but we really do we want to make it clear I mean because it, it probably if it shouldn't be just the chair that gets to, to establish the committee it would be the vote of the board, but then somebody has to make the appointment to who's going to serve on the committee, and maybe that wouldn't be the chairperson. I don't know. I mean, but I was just going to say. I would seek input from you guys. Our our organizational um, policy. <laughs> oops. We have a policy on it. Um, we're already. It says in two point, um, and I'm sorry. Uh, 2.21 where it says um, I'm sorry for some reason it's just being difficult to know where the chairperson already appoints the committees so we would have to have a, a conversation with that um, it says the chairperson shall preside at all school board meetings and appoint committees. Um, it is uh, policy 2.21. So it says um, the chairperson shall preside at all school board meetings, appoint committees. Um, and perform such duties as may be described by uh, prescribed by law, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think, and it, it's certainly something we can either have conversation or bring back on that. But I would think that we would workshop it. I, th I think that is it and is the way because it, I I believe what this is meaning is appointing committee representatives from the school board, as in the school board members. Mm -hmm which is what typically the chairperson does. You, you annually review the appointments of, of what board members are on what committees. I think that's the case. I think that's yeah, but the safety and security committee and the long range board right. committee. Because the right superintendent right. appoints the staff members. It was two point but is this says special committees that are going to be dissolved for a final report. And so I think those committees that we all serve on 
our recurring meetings mm -hmm. to just do the business of the board. So that's that might be it's two separate things. Yeah. yeah. So when the special committee is formed, and I did the research I did, so a lot of districts, I mean, obviously, we have appointed superintendents, they'll put together a, a superintendent search committee, so they appoint a committee for the board to you know, help the process. We don't have to worry about that because we got elected superintendent. So, other committees, if we wanted to, if we deemed it's important that we do a committee on growth uh, for, you know, the next school or, or the location of the school, the board would have to decide to put the committee together. Right. We already got that covered too. This well, would be like the Blue Ribbon Committee that you had years ago. But this says special committees. So yeah, it, like, it could be any committee that we deem as, as a board. If we wanted to put together a special committee, yes. you yeah. know, we could do that, right? So yeah. if we wanted to put together something dealing with a specific planning issue, we could do that. So the board, if three members of the board want to put together a planning committee <coughs> separate from this other committee to study a new development that's coming in and look at growth or a possible school site, we could do that, right? And that's what this says, correct? I mean, that's how we change it. It wouldn't be the chair that gets to appoint the, or gets to derive the committee, it'd be the board, but then the chair would be the one to appoint members of that committee which I would hope would work with the other board members and the superintendent to come up with who's going to be best to be on that special committee. Right. Would that not? Would that be right? That's why you're on safety. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, could, you could appoint a special committee for any, any reason, I guess, related to education. But the Long Range Planning Committee has provisions for. Yeah, that, that, that was, was just, just an example. example. That, that was, was just an example. example. What I'm trying to think is the big picture. Of if we have a special committee. It's going to have to be a vote of the board to, uh, to, to develop the committee, right? We all agree we want this committee. So we got that answer, but we don't have an answer who's going to appoint the committee members. That's what's not clear. And I've said we workshop it and come up with something we all agree upon and bring it up to the next board meeting. You know, I don't think the board member has to be on the special committee. No, I think yeah. so. He can be on the yeah. special committee. I don't think, and it can only be one if there were to be a board member. All right. Right? But again, if it's a special committee of the school board, who gets to decide who's on the committee? You know, and, I, and what you're saying, we're going to workshop it. Ideally, this is all what we agree on, and we work with the superintendent to figure out who's the best people to be on the committee. But I just, it doesn't really give clarity to that. But it, well, it does say this. It says the duties um, of such committee shall be outlined at the time of the appointment. We could say the duties uh, and assignments. And assignments. Or, or I think assignments. that would be a do it because we could do that. Because let's again going back to the blue ribbon yes. committee. You, you we may you. say, well, each of us would like to appoint yes, a, right. a person, yeah. or we might say, no, this is really yeah. where we're wanting staff and that's the community right. to get together. So there, the it, it of could vary based committee. on what the needs could be. So the, the duties of any such committee and committee assignments yeah. shall be outlined at the time of the appointment. And that way it, it hits it for the need of whatever the specific need is. I like that. I mean, what is, what, uh, Mr. Dixon, what yes. is a special committee? You said a blue ribbon committee. Uh, what are some other committees that other school districts have, have put together besides the superintendent search committee? What are some other ones that we know? You could set up a committee to study something like whether you want to convert to solar power or something like that and have them have a team of people that are experts in that area report back to you on, on its findings. Yeah, you need that. So you've got connections that do that would work. Yeah. <laughs> any, any kind of topic, I guess, related to education. And this didn't, this came to us simply because NEFEC, or it's simply units saw that we don't have this policy and they recommend that we have it, correct? No, it was in the update, in their updates. Okay. To, for all the districts they serve to put something in their policy this issue. No, no other factor came into play. It's just totally updating the policy. Just so you know what to do. Just good governance. Yes. I think they have. But I can, I can change it to add the duties of any such committee and committee assignments. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So when you set up a committee, you'll determine that. We'll do it at that time. And the question there too that I had was on the telecommunication networks a part of that. Is that that's what they're doing on, on all these policies now that uh, 
Uh, yes, just want to make sure it's clear because we technically can't attend telephonically, can we, um, Mr. Bradshaw? You can attend tele. You can attend telephonically. You can't continuously attend, attend right. telephonically, but you, there's ways that you can attend that you are unable to attend. You have to have a legitimate reason why you're not going to be there. But the but the committee the committee's are the problems you have. I mean, you can't. You have somebody that's sick. Okay, we're ready to go to B. Thanks. The next one is a new policy. This one was not generated by NEPEC. This was generated <laughs> by a student wanting to use a drone specifically for education purposes. And, uh, I did solicit input from other districts and from NEPEC on this issue and incorporated. I used mainly the Marion County policy. Because I, I saw Marion County on the ribbon when I pulled yeah. this one up. Yeah. I mean, is it, did you see Marion County in the actual language of the policy? No, but it was up on the ribbon. It was a title. Oh, title. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, some notes I have here the State High School Athletic Associations are treating this use of drones differently throughout the United States, like some states prohibit them outright, other states allow them. Uh, local roles are evolving in this area, specific guidelines could be developed for educational use, or the use of drones could be prohibited and revisited when it uses more widespread and policy direction is more developed. I like that. Uh, we can do that, <laughs> but we do use them for maintenance and security want to leave that open. Uh, one option would be uh, the limited use of floor maintenance, building maintenance and security. So, uh, <clears throat> well, Tom said uh, they can't operate within 400 feet of structure. They can't operate at all if they do that. Well, that's, you have to have a large area if you do like a track across country. I don't know how um, all this is going to shake out, but um, usually the use of drones is done when schools aren't in the session. So you don't have yeah. people actively in the building successfully. So when you're checking our roofs, there's no no children there, right? Usually not. Okay. And I know they're used for security, but my problem is when you mention athletics, there's a, a mm -hmm. conflict between 2B, which says any staff member who requests the use of an unmanned association uh, must seek permission from the school principal where the unmanned drone will be flown. Uh, so, drone in an athletic program. And then if you go over to, um, to let's see, uh, B, go over to 4B, um, we cannot use them within reasonable expectation of privacy exists in areas normally being private by social norms of structure not in the residential areas. Okay, so that's out. Um, and then they can't be flown in classrooms or gymnasiums and then they also can't be formed with um, in 3I, staff and students shall not operate in an unmanned area of room within proximity to or above individual crowd or vehicles to include parking lots, bleachers, sporting events. Mm -hmm. I, there's too much conflict in this conversation. I mean, I'm not happy with this thing at all. And and I just on that same note, when I, I maybe I'm reading it wrong, but if you look at 3E, students and staff shall not operate an un, you know, drone of, uh, above 400 feet or within 400 feet of the structure as outlined. But if we're talking about even on a football field and they're talking about having a drone competition, yep. it's going to be within 400 feet of the school, of the, of the school buildings. So I, I, this isn't just, Mr. Dixon, first of all, this is a lot of work you've been taking on. So, yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I did look at some of these areas of conflict. A lot of that comes from the FAA. No, and, and I realize it did, but like, I think at one time in Lakanto uh, Park, there was a drone 
field course, course, and it's it's probably within 400 feet of a structure. Okay, Mr. Dodd. I don't think they ever did that. I don't think they ever approved. It never got off the ground. I think. It, it, oh, I I thought, it, it, no, I thought it. Uh, I, I thought, thought they had some people there. Right. So I did do the background on the FHSAA, and um, there is not a guideline on drones. There's not. It, it, the, the only guideline is is that the use of drones is prohibited on the premises of any FHSAA state championship series event. Um, so, and they also I looked for the guideline because I obviously want to find out. I, I want to see these guidelines because it referenced in the the, the bottom it referenced the. The Florida High School Athletic Association guideline uh, guidelines, but it's it's the handbook, and there's individual sports handbooks. But um, I mean, I'm not sure where Marion County um, used this guideline book from, um, but they don't have they have a handbook on the sports. But I will say this that. That was my thought over coaches um, being a, uh, you know, their school coaches <coughs> will fly drones to watch plays and, you know, to, to videotape a play uh, to review. And so the FHSCA doesn't have a policy on that. It would be up to individual counties or private schools to develop their own policies for athletic competitions. The only policy they have is that it's prohibited at any state championship series. Right. In order to use one at an athletic facility, it would have to be almost at the altitude, the highest altitude, which is 400 feet. It would have to be, it could be over the facility. It would be, and you know, it, it could potentially be done, but you know, we don't want to do it. We can just. Uh, well, here's the other big one. Under Operation A, they are not allowed to use them within five miles of an airport without prior notification and written acknowledgement from the airport authorities. Yes. That's how, that excludes all of our Citrus uh, Crystal River schools and our Citrus High schools and all of our Inverness schools and possibly Floral City. So the only ones that could really fly would be Citrus Springs. Well, that without their approval. Well, I'm, I don't know that, you know, our, our airports are, you know, Crystal River's privately owned. They got the permit for I don't know whether they want drones flying around with the kids. And then the other one I have, I didn't see any responsibility where it says um, drones, if the first paragraph says drones is a privilege that comes with specific responsibilities, and I see absolutely no responsibilities for the children. I see a whole bunch of liabilities for the school system and the teachers. Like it says, who's going to retrieve one of these things that are broken? Students can't retrieve them. So who's going to retrieve them? I'm, you One know. of the subs do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, thing is, this thing is just so far off any policy that I want to be involved with. Um, I think drones right now, we don't have an industry that's going to deliver pizzas using a drone. I mean, well, the it, question is, then, do you want to just not have a policy yet and kind of put it on the back? I, I think until we can prepare something. Um, and it says that we've got to provide these drones as a school system. We're having trouble providing iPads. We're going to provide kids with drones? No, no, no. Where does it say that? Um, where's the last? <coughs> no, it's, that's just if we decide to use drones for our uh, uh, one prohibited for this maintenance department. To, if we decide to buy drones to use for our own purposes. Okay. And I thought, that we're not going to provide them. And what about the insurance on how does insurance? Yeah, I don't. Well, that would have to be approved and on a case by case basis. They would have to submit an application to use a drone, and then it would, they might have to provide insurance depending on what the activity was. But what if the maintenance department is using a drone and then they crash into a classroom or something? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they okay, use sure. it when the students aren't here. They just inspect buildings. Or, or any group, any group that does something with a crash or something that needs to be paid. So I would think you know, a person would sue to get a drone back. So the graduation, I know Chris Rivers had a drone there on yes. a couple occasions. <coughs> That's not really allowed. That's so our, with this policy, I was looking through the policy on it. It doesn't really, would that prevent a vendor a vendor then from doing it, flying a drone over a group of people like the graduation? Well, they're not really allowed to do that anyway, whether we have a policy or not, because the 
FAA uh, requirements. They, they're supposed to be licensed. They're not supposed to be flying over people. They're not supposed to be flying after dusk and between dusk and dawn. You know, there's all kinds of rules that apply whether we have a policy or not. So, okay, okay. So, the FFA, the FAA prohibits. I thought like if someone lived in a residential area, they could fly that drone within line of sight over any structure. Like if someone lived over here behind WTC in one of the houses and they were flying a drone, are they not allowed to fly over? I thought the only FAA regulation was over and dealt with airports. No, there's a lot more in there. Um, you're not supposed to fly uh, you know, between desk and dawn. You have to be a licensed drone pilot. You okay. It's an expected Line of sight. That's you know, you can't be in a moving vehicle while you're flying it. Uh, you can't fly it more than 100 miles. And there's all kinds of rules that apply that people just fly them. They don't ever check. You know, it's that's why you don't see as many of them as you first did when they first yeah. came out. But yeah. that's why you have policy I'm bringing forward is because yeah. Yeah. a lot of people aren't aware that there are rules that govern the use of drones. So this yeah. would, you know, made it. Uh, but what we could do is we could modify the policy that just says the use of drones is prohibited on school property except for you know, maintenance and security. Well, I think there's two. There's a couple of things, though, and, and that's the, you know, one of the things is that we're not really defining what the drone is. And an example of that is we've got drone clubs at some of our schools. And so I, I and there is a difference between a drone that is designed to go up several hundred feet and take photographs, and then there's some that are truly designed to fly in this room. That they're, they're very small, ultralight, and they're they considered drones, but they are very different purposes. They can actually learn to fly those and then become a certified drone operator. But, for example, we might have clubs that want to use them within the gymnasium in a very perfectly appropriate educational for, you know, uh, use. And I don't know that we want to discourage that type of, of situation in the policy, which I don't think was the intent at all. But at the same time, I think we've got to have some policies that govern proper use to protect our schools and the safety of our, our students. So I, I do think we have a balance there. So what are we doing with this? We're going to table it? Well, I mean, what I, we could do is we could wait until we see how the direction comes from other districts because they're one Wait and see, I like that. I mean, yeah. Write that down. I don't know, I have to see, and Tom has alluded to some of them being used in the classroom, but I have to see an educational application for this policy. And I, I don't see anything in this, this policy that we're seeing right now that applies to any student learning and having more job employment opportunities. Oh, they, I mean, I mean drone, drone games, operators but, are a huge new demanding. But, but where they go, if, if they're working down at the distribution plant for Amazon, they're trained by Amazon in that plant. I mean, it's not our job to, to, to train them to work in that factory to move equipment and stuff like that. I think, the aero, I think you'll find the aerospace is a, a growing career and technical education certification world right now, and I, I won't be surprised if we aren't having more conversations about it. Some of them. Well, it's, who came to the board meeting with And that's what I was just going to say. It's, it's, it's in that, that same. That might be the one to help us formulate a policy specific to us. And this policy has got too many, I don't want to see any of it. Loose ends. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's conflicting, and I don't, I don't like it. I don't like any of this. Okay. Why don't I just? I wrote down wait and see it, yeah. but maybe we could. Take, take this back and maybe work on it a little bit. <coughs> we, have we have clubs on campuses right now. That Good are idea. Clubs. We'll move to C now. Maybe get Ms. Counts to get some. Yeah. Get Ms. Okay. Well, I can talk to her about it. And then we can maybe bring it back when we have a little more specificity. I know in 1800, they didn't worry about drones. And I think the guidelines should cover the the drone clubs now. Right. That, that's are there, I mean, yeah. make sure the liability issue, right? Mr. Bradshaw, as far as... Just going to have to rework that and bring it back to the next uh, another workshop, though. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And something, just while I'm thinking of it, too, you had in here um, at the principal's 
um, in advance approval by the principal, and I'm wondering if it should be the superintendent or designee. Well, it might be both because whoever's, whichever site they're going to apply it at needs to be the one who understands when it's going to be flown, and then the designee would be probably Mr. Palmer, and he would have to review it for the risk management mission. Yeah. So it would have both. When we do a little application, they would have to fill it out and get approved before they can do it. And then we've got to comply with all these FAA things. But I think we want to make sure we're not prohibiting, you know, current learning and educational happenings that are currently going on. So that I don't want to prohibit that. And I don't think, again, that was the intent. But I, I, that concerned me as I looked through this right now. I might have to do a little more research on the threshold of what defines a permit. There, there is definitions for that. Yeah, I know there is, but it's, I think there may be, I know that uh, it's a gray area in terms of using those uh, in, for educational purposes because they still can cause mm -hmm. damage. So we'll, I'll do a little more research on that. Thank you, sir. I did like it. Okay, C, update C. policy. Uh, this is the uh, update to the policy 6.531 Deferred Retirement Option Program. And uh, Ms. Swain and I had some conversations based on some input. And uh, let's see. Authorization, because that was where my, my problem was. Authorization by? Authorization from a supervisor, approval by the school board, and approval by the FRS. Okay, supervisor at their school. Are you going to say supervisor instead of principal? Yeah, because, yes, this counts because it sometimes are cost centers. So like okay. Boy, myself, Eric Stokes would be the supervisor, not necessarily, they wouldn't be the principal, so that's why we, we could put okay. principal slash supervisor. Supervisor okay. works. Okay. Supervisor at, at the school. At the school or cost center. School and cost center and approval by the school board and then the division, should we say the division? Are we talking about the division, the DOE? We, no, we put by approval by the Florida Retirement System. We changed okay. that from the FR. division. And Chuck and I made that spirit very specific to FRS. Okay. That's the Just so, so the people entering that that extra three years knows that they have to have three different things to be eligible for this extended time. Each year. Each year. Yes, it's each year. Okay. So Chuck and I modified that to change that to put it that yes, they have to sign a new recommendation form, drop extension paperwork, and it be approved by the school board. It's on the golden rod for every single year. Yes, ma'am. So, Um, just for clarification, too, there's been a lot of um, misinformation or, or lack of information or an understanding about drop. And my question is, is if we didn't pass this policy at all, where do the drop laws come from? What governs the, uh, the drop system in general? Because I didn't... I know we're putting here in policy, but really this is for, I think, information. Is, is DROP something that's decided locally, or is DROP something that's decided at, at a different level? Correct. It is, as Chuck said, it is for the statute, and then we go by the Florida Retirement System, the guidelines and procedures for that system. So if we just, if, if for some reason we said we did not want to allow someone to be part of DROP, is that something, Mr. Bradshaw, that would even be within our abilities or would we would need to follow statute which would mean they're allowed to go with the drop yes for, 
It's up to, so they are allowed to go in for those five years depending on age and eligibility. Then those three years of extension, the principal has to, or the supervisor, has to approve on a yearly basis that three years of extension. And, and is DROP something that's only for public school systems, or, or is it for? State and state employees. State. State. Yeah. I think the only differences are like count, uh, municipalities are in a different retirement system. So law enforcement potentially would have this, first responders, yes. um, you know, anyone who's working in government. Yes. So I, I, I give that clarification because I'm not sure that's always understood, that this is not a local decision about drop. This is a decision that is decided at a statutory level. And really, if we didn't like the parameters here, this board does not have the authority to make that decision. Is that correct? It is run by statute. So this is just statute. So again, if we did not adopt this and correct this, um, it would not mean that somebody wouldn't be entitled to drop or to, to meet the parameters. We would, they would still be able to comply with statute. Yes. And I'm not suggesting we don't pass this policy, but I'm just wanting to make sure that, that, that I understood that correctly. In this particular paragraph, it just applies to instructional It's designed so that if you need to keep people from retirement, you need to stay around for up to three more years. And I think um, in section one, it also just modifies it from the 30, from the 96 to the 60, which is why then that section three gets incorporated, because it basically that's where you pick up the other 96. But that's just for instruction. Any other comments? Retaining tool for some of our teachers that they don't want to retire right now, but there's too much money in the drop program. I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit longer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bring it back. Okay, educational services, Dr. Hebert. Not Dr. Hebert. I am here this morning just to give you an update on our instructional continuity plan. A few months ago, we brought to you the 10 components of the original instructional continuity plan. The purpose of this plan, along with our ESSER funding, is to continue to plan, respond to, and mitigate the impact of the pandemic, and to promote the health, safety, and welfare of all of our stakeholders in our school community. Now, previously, the state required us to go over the 10 components, which if you look on page two, the table of contents, I'll briefly review the 10 components to see if you all have any questions. These components were brought before the board and have also been sent to the state for approval. They have approved our plan thus far. Now, in addition today, what I would like to cover are the federal requirements, because not only do we have state requirements for the instructional continuity plan, we also have federal requirements. So I'll go over those federal requirements in a moment, but I would like to review the initial 10 components that we submitted to the state. So the first component is leadership and planning. This component focuses on ensuring that our district and school level leadership teams have processes for the following. We have to ensure that we have access to devices and the internet for our students, staff, and school community, access to basic needs, access to curriculum, which is our Canvas learning management system that we have in place, and also that we're supporting our teachers and families in the event that we would need to go to distance learning, and also that we have a communication plan in place to communicate with all stakeholders. The second component are curriculum resources and digital content. That's our learning management system. We have Canvas in place for all of our teachers, students, and families to access, and we also have training plans in place. Component three and four deal with professional learning for our teachers and also support so that we can ensure that they have time to collaborate and share best practices. 
Component five is parent and family support. We have to ensure that we have communication processes in place in the event that we would need to go to distant learning. We also have communication plans in effect just in general in regards to our website, social media, call outs. We are getting ready to implement Remind and of course we have our school messenger. Component six and seven deal with technology and that's really the infrastructure we have in place to ensure that our network is safe and that we are providing internet access to our families. Component eight is engaging students with limited access. We have to ensure that we have strategies in place to help support learning for all of our students. For example, our English language learners, our students with special needs, and of course, we are providing internet access to our students in remote areas. Component nine is continuation of school operations. We have to have a plan in place to provide food services and transportation to our families in the event of an emergency. And then component 10 is just emergency and ongoing communication processes. So that encompasses our 10 components that were required at the state level. Do you all have any questions in regards to those 10 components before I go on? I know it was repetitive, but I like the idea that we've filled in all the slots underneath each one of the components. It, it looks like a very thorough, thorough job. Thank you. And Ms. Taylor, when you put the, the structure of this out, because I, I agree the structure is, is, is excellent, it, is that the expectation of both the state and the federal government? Is Did they put like and say, okay, you have to meet component one and then subcategory? They're different. So the state- <laughs> Of course they are. Yes. <laughs> so the state originally put out the 10 components. So those 10 components I just reviewed are required by the state. Mm -hmm. They are also required by the federal government. In addition to those 10 components, however, the federal government also requires that we put into place safety measures that specifically address the CDC guidelines. That is not a requirement of the state. The state has approved our initial plan. The federal government has required that additional piece. In addition, we also have to get public input on our plan. So our plan a few months ago, originally with those 10 components, was shared at a board meeting. We also have engaged our federal program stakeholder committee. We've shared this entire plan with them. And then Mr. Bittner has met with our superintendent council students at the high school level just to talk about the safety measures we have in place to ensure that uh, we get that student's perspective on, on how we're doing and keeping our, our students and staff safe. And each of the uh, CSF, let's say one through five in, in component one, are those again given by the state and or the federal government? Okay, so so when when we're asked to, for example, to ensure uh, access to devices and the internet, uh, the following processes have been developed. The state told us, you're gonna need to do that, now you need to tell us how you're going to do that. Yes, correct. Yeah. And it's all tied to the ESSER funds. Yeah, I was going to say, I think they, they do give us the ESSER funds to, to help with that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Say that again, Ms. Powers. I couldn't hear you. Oh, just records on the fact that we had done it. Got you. Okay. <clears throat> so, I want to move on to the next piece. So, in addition to the federal requirements, and I, I shared with you, we have to get input. We, we also did send out a survey, I forgot to mention to all of our families, that just um, asked in regards to the ESSER funding for our families to prioritize what was important to them. So we did seek input through a survey and we had 418 responses. Ms. Kaylor, I had a request for a five minute break. For what? Five minute break. Oh, okay. Thank you. Let's be back at 10 hours. Months now, from here on out, we'll have to bring back to the board for discussion. We'll take to our superintendent councils at the high school and also present to our federal program stakeholder committee so that we can ensure input from all stakeholders in our community. And then it also will address any updated CDC guidelines. Everybody, everybody. It's been a process. So I wanna share with you the federal uh, requirements. So we are 
required to include how we will maintain the health and safety of students, educators, and other school staff, and the extent to which it has adopted policies and or safety measures on each of the CDC's guidelines. So I'm going to go bulleted through the bulleted list of the CDC guidelines and how we address them. So the first one's universal and correct wearing of masks. Florida Executive Order 21-175 ensures parents' rights to choose if they want their child to wear a mask. Following the executive order, students nor staff are required to wear masks. However, Citrus County Schools support <coughs> students and staff choosing to wear a mask. It is strongly recommended that personal protective equipment be worn while working in the clinics and isolation rooms. The procedure for the correct wearing of masks video is reviewed by clinic staff and has a review by the nurse at the beginning of each school year. The next one, we have to ensure that we are modifying facilities to allow for physical distance when possible. So an example of this would be at the elementary level. For example, at lunchtime, we may only have one grade level in the cafeteria when we could have had two to three grade levels just to try to spread some distance. We also have cohorts going to recess together. Those are just some examples when possible and feasible. Hand washing and respiratory etiquette. We have hand washing posters around. We put on our morning show uh, reminders to continuously wash your hands. We do the happy birthday song. It's recommended that you sing the happy birthday song to yourself three times. So we have those practices in place to make sure that we are continuously washing our hands. Cleaning and maintaining healthy facilities, including improving ventilation. So as needed, Citrus County Schools conducts nightly deep cleaning with CDC approved agents. The hard services and classrooms are cleaned multiple days with CDC approved cleaning agents. Ventilation improvements are being completed with HVAC updates and filter changes as recommended by the CDC. So the next piece, I'm gonna have Ms. Pumpa talk about the contact tracing in combination with isolation and quarantine. send them the names of the students that were in contact and then they were notifying all of them as contacts through the health department so a lot of that has changed when we do contact tracing now the schools are doing that for the ones that are, are just really in the close proximity of another student who ends up testing positive so the quarantining um, or the contact tracing and then of course uh, quarantining is still going on even though our numbers are going down um, which is a great thing one a couple of things that have changed based on the cdc guidelines for teachers we have been able that if a teacher tests positive they don't have to be out um, any longer than five days as long as their symptoms get you know they improve they don't have a fever without medicine so those 10 days out that we were seeing are longer with teachers now they can come back after the five days um, if a teacher has been in contact with a positive um, other staff member family member and they're asymptomatic they do not have to quarantine which was what we had you know what we were doing before the the uh, from the student standpoint, because we are governed under the Florida Department of Education on the student part of it, the students that test positive are still staying home for that 10 day quarantine period unless they um, receive a note from a doctor to return before those that amount of time. 
The other thing that has changed, and I think it, it has improved um, with more students being able to, to stay in school, is if a student is in contact with a positive, we used to make them stay home, as long as they are asymptomatic, the parents have a choice to send them back to school. So being in, in contact with a positive, we're allowed now to let the students come back as long as they don't have any symptoms, where before we didn't have a choice on that. Those are probably the biggest things that have changed, um, you know, with, um, with the CDC guidelines. Everything else is pretty much the same. Um, our, um, you know, with the quarantine, schools have been great about that, keeping track of everything. Um, I've just looked at the statistics since uh, February 15th up to um, yesterday. We've had seven total staff members who have tested positive, which is way, way down. I mean, we're if things are, are looking bright. And then as far as students, since um, February the 15th, so for the last five days, only 17 students throughout the whole district um, have we received information for positive tests through the Department of Health. So um, the schools are doing great. Um, again, things are looking up and hopefully we'll continue, uh, you know, to uh, move in a positive direction. Uh, yeah, just quickly, in reference to the employees that do teach positive, do test positive, we're still doing a COVID um, sick pay or, or there's still a coverage for that out of, out of the ESSER money, is that right? Yes, as long as they are um, a positive or a presumed positive, yes, HR is still um, covering that. Okay, and but that has to be a PCR, a, a rapid, is that, that can't be a home test or? No. Okay, it's gotta be a PCR. And sometimes some will test at home and see that they're positive and then they want to gain you know, their, their days back um, if they've not used the tent that, that HR allots and then they'll go and get like a test through the health department and with that verification, um, that goes and to that's, HR. That's still up to 10 days, so that's still up in effect, right? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That all? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then the last few pieces have to deal with our communication and coordination with the Citrus County Health Department. So diagnostic and screen, screening testing, we collaborate with the Citrus Department of Health to provide information to our parents and staff on available testing sites. We do not offer the testing at our schools. And we also have offered vaccines to all of our staff in, in conjunction with the Department of Health. Are they doing the booster spots too now? Are they to do that boosters? Is that what the department boosters? They have been providing that. Okay. When, the ones that are available, yes, they have provided boosters. Mm -hmm. And we go to the health department to get it okay. Yes, we we have not had any more um, of the vaccinations like the school site, like we did that one time. It's all at the other sites. Now, I, I think just the majority of them are done at the, um, at the health department, although some of the um, doctor's offices and pharmacies also have it. Mm -hmm. Still safe thing, and the boosters and all of that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Do you all have any other questions? Thank you, Trish. You're welcome. with the continuity plan. Um, I just, you had asked for us to bring back the ARC budget from, um, I think it was the January meeting when we had it. So um, since then, we have, um, the state has asked us to move some stuff around. The um, activity one is learning loss. And um, we had to have 20% of the budget in, in for learning loss. So they, um, sent it back and had us move a few things around. So everything's still in the plan. It's just been moved from maybe testing 
and um, other pieces into the learning loss piece. So um, you, you were provided that, it was on, on the agenda. Um, we also did have, as Ms. Kaler said, we had the uh, survey that we sent out to parents and um, Ms. Johnson, or Ms. Kaler and I had the federal stakeholders meeting. So we got all our input in that's required by the state. Um, so I, if you want, I'll go over this again, item by item, but we did go over it in January. You just asked for us to bring it back. Some of the sections, I know you had questions, like it said, address, um, activity 2F said to address the unique needs of low-income children or students, children with disabilities, English learners, racial and ethnic minority students experiencing homelessness and foster care youth, including how outreach and service delivery will meet the needs of each population. And we had that blank before. Now we have said see activity one because we had to have so much in activity one to meet the requirement. So we really could have taken a lot of activity one and placed it in all these other ones, but they address it in activity one, a lot of those other activities. So, um, all the stores in the area are down because the testing is so different. What is that uh, legal or uh, Italian with the COVID and stuff? Is, is there a relationship or what down far because of COVID? The requirements are done. Yes. Yeah. Regarding progress monitoring, going to that? No, well, we had the, the <coughs> testing change in the state. Uh, yeah, the testing hasn't formally changed yet. It's in legislation. I mean, they are, they're bringing it up. It's proposed that next year we will have a different, um, we wouldn't have what testing looks like now. Yeah. It will look different is what they're proposing. However, it has not gone uh, and been approved yet, but we are anticipating that it will and that it will be moving more to a progress monitoring approach versus uh, one summative assessment at the end of them. Yeah, I understand that. Now, what was there one? So like two years back when we had a change also, or that was just the discussion that we were going to have a change? I think it might have been discussion. Does it have any question? Yeah. Is that into the, yeah, I was just seeing if it was a tie in there with the COVID. Mm -hmm. So um, as you know, if you look at the continuity plan versus the, the budget, a lot of the things that we, you know, are doing in the continuity plan, the communication pieces, the technology pieces, those are all in um, the ESSER and the ARP, the ESSER ARP funds. So um, I don't know if there's any other questions or would you like me to go back over it line uh, by line? I have a question. Okay. On the, um, the student iPad lease, so we're gonna recoup $4.1 million or so on the iPad right. lease, right? So yeah. that's gonna free up that money that we had allocated in the budget, or we've already spent, because it, it's not just, it, it goes back. Right, we're to, able to go back to March of 2020. Anything that we've, we've spent, or expense that we can relate back to COVID, um, and the iPads, definitely the students needed their iPads so um, they could go home and do their work. We have put that in the um, application to recoup that money for those leases. And, and so they have approved that? Um, it hasn't been officially approved. They asked us to move that stuff around and it got sent back up on Friday. So, but they didn't question the leases. The only thing they questioned was, it was really the bus aids we had in the learning loss and our logic was pretty much if we can keep kids coming to school, then the absenteeism doesn't happen and therefore they're not losing their learning by not being in school. They didn't buy that, so we had to move that to other and move some other things into into the activity one. Because that's their big thing. They want you to address learning loss. But the aids were one of the positions encouraged children to be doing their homework or reading on the bus. Correct, correct. And we had that in there. But they did not um, agree that that was addressing the learning loss. So you know, so we, it's still in it's still in the plan. It's still in here. It just had to be moved from activity one down to the, another activity. So we had to move some stuff from the other activities up into one that we could, um, you know, put as learning loss. So I think we moved edgenuity up into um, number one, 
the, the, the Windsor learning, the ingenuity. Um, we expanded the summer school into the final summer of the art plan to cover the, that part of the summer. Achieve 3,000 in near pot. We moved all those into activity one. Um, say, you know, to address learning loss. Instead of down in the, it was in another activity lower on the page. And the Wi-Fi access for buses, that's not in here. That's the technology assistance plan. Right, so that's we're not seeing anything. From the ESSER 2. Right. So nothing with continuity, continuity of services, but I thought that was kind of tied into the. The, um, well, the, but we already have it in there, so we can't pay for it out of two different pots. I mean, it's already in ESSER 2 for the technology. Okay, and so our iPads were no, and not in any of the ESSER. No, we didn't put them in any of those. We were, the, with ESSER 1, you know, we only had about 4 million, so we were just trying to get through the initial part of COVID. I mean, we had to spend, you know, over a million dollars in just masks and cleaning supplies and things like that. And then ESSER 2, they really broke that up into different pieces. and and we weren't able to put the iPad lease in there. So then now ESSER 3, with it being such a large amount, we're able to recoup some of that. And also the staff computers that we just purchased, you know, we put that in there, the radios, um, and we're able to recoup some of the testing, the student testing computers that we purchased post-March of 2020. We're gonna be able to recoup some funds from that. And the indication is that this is all going to be approved. I mean, it's all. It's so far, they just questioned. They questioned um, the let's talk, how that, how let's talk contributed to this, and it's in our continuity plan. So it was kind of interesting that they questioned let's talk, and also um, <coughs> mailing out the um, the student the calendars has lots of information now about COVID. Mm -hmm. So they just questioned that and. You know, our logic is we have all these different means. We have newspaper, we have mailings, we have internet. Not everybody has internet. So, you know, we're able to reach them through mail and newspapers. So they were fine with that. The bus aids was their biggest concern of what. And the fact that they didn't really mind on the activities to address unique needs of low-income children or students and children with disabilities, racial minorities, they didn't mind us just referring to 20% no. learning loss. No, and that was really one of their suggestions of what to do because they have that that big chunk of 20% in activity one. They said we know a lot of the other activities are addressed in activity one, and it's a little redundant, some of their different yeah, activities. Yeah, it's kind of like why did they even include that question? Right. I mean, you think if it was a priority that you have other activities besides the 20% learning loss, but it must not be. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Tammy. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, state of the district. Who's first? No. no. Bus. Oh, I forgot B. <laughs> Do the buses. Sorry. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep. So this morning I would like to uh, provide a, a presentation. It's a little bit lengthy. Um, so I think that um, you probably have a lot of questions, but if you'll give me a moment to go through the entire presentation, there's a good chance that I'll have answered many questions you have. And then of course you'll have the opportunity to answer or ask others. And then additionally, uh, we have uh, Mr. Gaskins is here with me to assist in my presentation. And then Rich has come from safety. So, we're excited to show you what we have. So, in the continuity plan for component six, we were looking at ways that we could address continuity of instruction for students who do not have connectivity at home. And in the past, what we did is we tried to come up with different ways that we could provide um, Wi-Fi on buses um, to students. So when we were um, had school closure with the pandemic, we had a, a couple buses that we sent out to remote locations, and we had, um, we had come up with some 
devices that we could use to provide access. It, would, it proved to be challenging with the method that we used, and so we were looking at ways that we could expand upon that um, and put Wi-Fi on more buses, because we only had it on a few buses as we were testing out different ways to achieve this. And so um, in doing so, we were investigating what other methods we could use. So the Wi-Fi in the bus would address component six, and that would give um, connectivity for students that do not have it at home. Sometimes it's because there just simply isn't um, broadband access where they live. Other times it's an economic issue. And then sometimes um, the signals are just, not, that's not even an option to send out a hotspot to the family to their actual home, but you could get a signal somewhat closer to their neighborhood. So the main purpose of the bus Wi-Fi initiative is to address continuity of instruction. So it is to provide a means that we could send a 181 buses out throughout our community and um, provide internet access to students. So it was um, part of the instructional continuity plan that was submitted and approved by the state. And the wording that we had was um, we had used a grant to, we said we would use a grant to install internet access, and that's the technology assistance grant that Mrs. Wilson referenced earlier. And so that would be used to provide the equipment needed for the buses. Uh, we also submitted and received approval for E-rate e to pay for um, unlimited 5G data on the buses. And so that has been completed. So the instructional continuity. The Wi-Fi will provide students with the connectivity at remote locations, as we said, but additionally, we can um, allow us to use it in the aftermath of a natural disaster or a hurricane or other school closure and um, also if we have another pandemic. Additionally, another benefit, we could use it in strategically placed buses um, for summer remediation or tutoring ef efforts even if we have communities where we know that there's a large population that does not have Wi-Fi at home. There are some additional benefits of um, purchasing this equipment. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands we would have the ability with this equipment to, um, one, it's filtered, it's our devices, our iPad devices only that would connect to the Wi-Fi. So it would have the filtering that we already have in place on our district owned devices and they would be able to access the same, same resources that they currently access at um, campus. Um, additionally, they, it, the offering would be on the ride to and from school. As you know, some of our students have lengthy bus rides. Um, and this would also benefit um, the AES students that sometimes have a very lengthy um, bus ride or the other academies. Uh, the McKinney Vento students sometimes have a lengthy bus ride and uh, extracurricular events. So we have the ability to allow that Wi-Fi access if they're traveling home from you know, an extracurricular band um, competition or sporting event. And then our Marine Science Station students, their ride can be quite long too. But additionally, we have um, our elementary students and our middle school students, they go out and visit the Marine Science Station and uh, they could actually participate in lessons on their way to and from their base school to the Marine Science Station. So these are just some additional benefits that would um, allow continuity of instruction to expand. So the current equipment that is on our buses is not capable of um, at working with the Wi-Fi and in fact, the way that we were um, designed in the continuity plan. But additionally, as of December 31st of this year, the equipment will need to be replaced because 3G will no longer be supported by the cell phone carrier. And so at this time, the current equipment uses a, a small, um, data package to allow the live GPS. Um, currently, uh, what she's speaking of, currently we have an LMU, which is a live monitor unit, and that live monitor unit sorry, is is what won't be supported by L, uh, by the, the 3G platform. Um, and the top of this, the 95,206, that would be to replace that equipment that we're already currently using as our live GPS tracking. Um, we can go in right now, I can, I can pull it up on my cell phone, it's a web-based. Um, EOC has access to this, 
if we have emergency EOC has uh, uh, log into this as well, where they can go in and see where the Jeep, where the bus is uh, live on GPS, and we can get uh, people to it if we if, if need be. Um, that's why that's part of this router um, that does that provides the Wi-Fi will replace that unit. It will get us up to the 5G platform. Um, it, What's not on here is also the, the router that is within the bus now. We call it Bullet. Um, when the bus is pulling into down the video, it uh, hooks to Wi-Fi on the buildings that are three compounds, and that's how we wirelessly down the video, which just helps with uh, one time of our employees and two, we don't replace hard drives anymore because we're not pulling any, pulling those hard drives in and out. So, but that also replaces that equipment that is now seven years old and we've already uh, experienced some failures. Um, but that's what the, the, the router by itself will replace that equipment that will need to be eventually replaced. Yes, it's um, in the tonight. I'm sorry if I talk to you, I know Kathy can wait till afterward, but you see the new person up and it's cut the slide here. Um, so, is the, is the 3G, I mean, is it really going to take place? I mean, I've, I've heard they're really bumping that back now. I mean, uh, not by December 31st of 2022. As of right now, 5G. Right, they're, they're, uh, December 2022 is when they're going to no longer support that 3G platform. So they're, they're trying to push us into the newer platform, the 4Gs and the 5Gs. Mm -hmm. Right, so are they going to be able to support it, though, I guess is my question, because I'm, I'm hearing a lot of information that, you know, 5G's caused a lot of problems, so everything's got kind of slow, slowing down with, with everything with 5G, and that, you know, we, we may be jumping out there a little too quick uh, because we're not going to be able to have the service. So when, when we move to equipment that supports 5G, it will still operate off of 4G. It's just that 3G is going away, and some, from my knowledge, some providers, it's even as early as um, like within a month or two, is what some right, but providers isn't, are telling their customers. Isn't that mainly for when they upload at the, the garage, or is it, it, it? It's not just for the upload. No, that speed. is strictly for the data. For the data on the GPS. Uh, when and another thing to that point, when we bring in, we're going to be unlimited on data, but. When the bus is coming to the compound, even if we do go to this, they're still going to hook to Wi-Fi and still be downloaded over our Wi-Fi. So when they're at the bus garage, they're on the Wi-Fi. They're not on the Wi-Fi. They're, they're connected to our network. Right. But when they're out on the road, and the feature of live look-in, that will be over the um, the data plane. That is that is cellular. So if and yes, and live GPS is currently cellular, but the router will take the place of what we currently have and will upgrade those systems. But the difference with our GPS right now with our cellular plan is we're kind of paid for the use, so it's not as it's not as much because we don't use nearly as much data as just getting that location as we would as if we're providing uh, Wi-Fi, and it's just a, it's a huge data difference from what we're currently using with our live GPS to if if we were to provide Wi-Fi. Now, in the future, for the continuing cost of this, getting past the initial hardware cost, if the device will support the same data plan that we're on now to where we can roll back that, that data cost if we don't, if we don't want to go to E-rate and we don't want to continue that cost of doing Wi-Fi, we can roll that back and we can still get the GPS aspect of the device moving forward. So, it, it, so the this SRC device just gives us this, just gives us a, a more broader uh, things to use with it. So the two hundred almost two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the SRC router, correct? Is the hardware? Is the hardware that cost? Is, that's going to be a five. This is uh, Rich from with Safely. Okay. This is the company with it. Um, he can show you the difference between what we have as a lot of monitoring currently and our new SRC router that would be a part of that 247,000. Okay. Good morning. So this is the existing LMU and it's pretty much a single device. So it's a single function, which is basically it plugs into the existing video recorder 
and provides it with uh, um, location <coughs> services. So it's pretty much kind of a, a single use. So the SRC router is this unit. So um, it combines GPS. So it actually feeds a GPS signal to the recorder. So the recorder knows where it is. And also we um, send that data back to our monitoring service so we can track the vehicle as we're doing the other. Um, so this also has a solar um, connection and Wi-Fi. So as Nathan said, when we're in the yard, uh, the Wi-Fi can be used to upload video, and then when we're off the road, the Wi-Fi is used for um, students to go onto Wi-Fi and go onto it for education. Question two on the GPS side of it. Um, currently, the GPS tracking that that has is monitored then back at the office or by the upward monitoring service. It, does that have the capability then of providing any GPS um, route information to the driver, which I don't believe we currently have, where the driver doesn't have GPS? That is a part of the additional feature, but that device allows that. Without that device, it, that the additional option is, is, doesn't come into play. So the additional option of the 262,000? That is, that is uh, contact tracing, they call it, from okay. student tracking, from tracking with, with the tracking issue, the tracking issue, mm -hmm. but that's where that comes from. But what I'm thinking too, though, is not necessarily that, but if I've got a substitute driver, if we have a substitute driver on route, and so that they have some support as to their route, is there is that what would be used then to provide them a like a, a display that would give them what that route information is? Correct. In the two hundred sixty-two thousand, we'll have a tablet in the bus, mm -hmm. and that'll be. Right now, we're doing paper, paper and pen as far as checking in our elementary kids. This collection, this will do it electronically. We'll, we're reporting the, the kids by touch of a button on that on that tablet. So there's not something on the student, it's just that the bus driver is then Correct. Is we just don't, we don't checking. We don't have them with having we're not, we're not, the yeah. cars, where it'll be loaded into the, into the program, and when they board the bus, they can touch the screen and then board the student. And then also, to hear about the driver, yes, we can load the, the routes, and it, just like in your car, it'll give you turn-by-turn -turn directions, and when you have a substitute that gets on, that's never driven that route before, when they turn the bus on and it comes up and brings that route up, it's going to tell them how to drive that route. And we don't have that. We do not have that no, now, have correct? Nothing, nowhere near, right? So this would would get, if if we were doing the two hundred sixty two thousand option, it would then give us a substitute and any driver drive by drive, uh, turn by turn directions. Correct. And it also will tell us we we constantly use our currently use Tyler for our routing and planning. It, will also tell us if, because we will load our information from Tyler to pull and sell, and then we will load it into Safely, and then Safely can tell us if a driver is not driving the route, if they're varying from the route. If we have an issue where we have drivers that are varying from route, and you know they, they'll, they'll make a house stop here, and then we have a sub get on, and the students are, you're, you're not going, we're supposed to go this way. This, will tell us if we have that situation happen. So that way when the sub driver gets on, they go out, they're driving the route, the kids know where they're going, the driver knows where they're going, the, the kids, the, the driver's gonna be driving the route that, they, that the kids expect them to drive. So it will cut back on those problems and it also, yes, it will be very beneficial to the drivers. That, the turn by turn, in my opinion, is the most beneficial to the drivers. Well, that, that's the one that keeps getting my attention because I know substitute drivers are a challenge for us. In getting new drivers to come on board is, is certainly something we want to attract. So if I'm sitting there thinking, listen, I'm, I, I just don't know what route I'm going to be doing, this would, I would think, accomplish that. And this is, this is new. There's not a lot of districts out there. So when we bring in, because we do bring in drivers from other districts, this could be a selling point of ours to bring in those drivers that are deciding between us and Hernando and us and Mary and us and Sumter. We might get that driver that comes to us just because of this feature. And we have some bus drivers that are, are doing two routes, especially at the elementary schools. They, they've done their route and they're zinging back and they're in the line to pick up another route 
we have them doing three routes. We have yeah. them, we have them going out doing a doing a middle high, an elementary, and then turning around and going back right out back. and running another route. So this this short. GPS would change with the route that they're we multiple can, routes we can that they're driving. Okay. That, that's that's we a have very feature. good bus drivers. So, yes. I'm yeah. sorry, Ms. Androsky, we weren't supposed to ask any questions, so <laughs> <laughs> we're done. She was done. She's oh, stepped she's, away. She's, yeah, she's, she's stepped away. She's done. <laughs> well, while you guys are there, though, um, <laughs> it, because I do think this is an important... I'm interrupting the chairman now. <laughs> are you... If there is a bus accident, if there is any incident, is there a, anything that, that this assists in any of that information? Um, just for example, had a, a pre meeting and we, we brought this up. Um, I was at the current time I was the current shop foreman on the Panto. Um, we had it was one of our survey buses and we had a bus driver who had a heart attack and he just laid over and it was one of our regular drivers was behind him and seen the bus go off the road. If not for that bus driver to be behind him, we would not have known what was going on. We watched the video after it was a fun video to watch. Um, the driver <clears throat> is passing, but when we lose communication with the driver, we don't know why. We don't know if they're got the holidays close to Christmas and they got their holiday tape cranked up and they just can't hear the radio, they turn the radio down. If we have live booking, we can look in and see if that's okay. If they call in an accident and we lose communication with the driver on that radio, we can do a live look of the bus and we can see the current situation that's going on inside the bus. We can, we can have an idea of extent of that emergency but currently that's not something we have no, the availability and then if there was uh, a vehicle that hit that bus is there anything that is there a, a uh, any type of crash alert or something that is part of the system as well I know I found my own car if I do if it does no, that so I didn't know there, okay. there are uh, there are G force, G force alerts within the DVR system but the the driver calling in would be a would be the thing. Okay. It's that would be the fastest response. Is the signal in the county gonna be able to give you a live look in if you're in Vistachata or Apache Shores or uh, the mini farms? I mean this I'll, I'll wait Ms. Androsky, but um, currently we're <laughs> we're using Verizon, but T Mobile has tested better as far as coverage and um, so we are, if we go to this, we are switching to T-Mobile. Uh, one of the benefits of this device is we have, it has the ability to have two different SIM cards in it. So you can have a Verizon data plan and a T-Mobile data plan if it is a situation where that bus goes in and out of signal and you have a better signal in an area with a different carrier. The downfall of that is you would have to buy, you have to pay for the data plan for both SIM cards. Yeah. You can run with both yeah. SIM cards at the same time. Yeah, that's but if we, if another is if like if you have Chaz and you got Verizon as strong as Chaz and not T-Mobile, we can change out the SIM card. It doesn't matter what what's feeding it. We can put whatever carrier we need for whatever area in that to feed. If, if, if we have that there. plan, if we if we buy the plan, the plan with that. Yes. There, I wanted to talk about, um, so we, in our uh, E-rate, we went with uh, T-Mobile. Uh, one of the reasons T-Mobile is due to our recent uh, dark fiber solution that we upgraded to. Um, the reason we were able to get that special construction so cheap was because they were in the area and uh, gave us a, a steep discount because they were already laying the fiber around our district for their two towers. So where at my house, for T-Mobile, uh, I had Sprint, which was called out by T-Mobile. Uh, I, I, I had to be on Wi-Fi to make phone call. I had no signal. And now I got five bars, full 5G, out off uh, a Fort Allen train. So the, where we did have bed spots, um, we, it's got full signal now. I do have, we do have some areas that we need to test fully, like out down 200. Uh, on stage coach, those type of areas, but uh, we're going to get those tested with the T-Mobile. I did see here too, I pulled up, FCC says that AT&T uh, sh is shutting down their 3G on February 2022. Verizon will shut it down still in December 20, 31st, 
2022, and T-Mobile is looking to shut it down this summer. Now, to Mrs. Dodd's point, though, in the past, when 1G and 2G, they have they have pushed those out. Yeah. But we don't want to wait until then, and then have and then lose ability because we didn't get ahead of it and we're ready when that change happened. So. Uh, let me just go back and <clears throat> reiterate. We know we have to replace the equipment that's on the bus now, the LMU. So we can continue with the LMU plan and replace that at a cost of roughly 97000 Um If we move to the Wi-Fi equipment with the router, then we will take care of that. We'll take care of the expense there, but we'll additionally be able to have additional features addressing the instructional continuity plan. We'll be able to provide the Wi-Fi access on the bus. We can strategically place that around the district to help our students in the event of a pandemic or nat you know, natural disaster. And then there are additional benefits along the way. If we chose to do so in the future, moving to this router equipment would also allow us some of those features. And Rich was gonna um, show you a couple of them. He will show you the live look-in because if we move the Wi-Fi direction, the live look-in is included in that price. But then additionally, did you have, were you able to show kind of what it would look like for the subs? Um, for that, we would need the, uh, the, um, the tablet. But essentially the tablet is, it's a fairly, it's a, a mobile rated tablet. So it's about an inch thick and it has a, has a mount to itself. And essentially through the, uh, the route management system, we can generate all the different school bus routes and then send them to the individual um, tablet. So it just shows up and there's also a voice prompt that says, take the next ride, same as your usual GPS in the car. Um, but that also well, it disappears on the tablet. And that's on a bus by bus basis. Are you gonna show us the live look in? Excuse me? We're going to show us the line. So this is a uh, very much a demonstration cloud. Um, so everything's up in, in the safety cloud. Um, essentially, each of the buses, this is just a, a system we have for our um, demonstrations back in, in the office. So essentially, um, all the buses would be named on, this, uh, on these pages. And then we could search for a bus, um, click on the individual bus, and then we start to show live video directly. Unfortunately, we don't have any vehicles. Um, my team is not, not running them at the moment. But essentially, they would be color coded to show whether we are online, if the uh, video is available, and we click on one of those links, uh, and live video will be shown on the right hand side of the page. And within the bus, you have five, four cameras. The uh, majority of the four cameras are new systems that we have our five wide screens that are uh, down the side of the vehicle, uh, looking down. At so what other rural districts in Florida do you have service right now? Um, unfortunately, I, I, I live in Florida, I'm down in Boca, um, but I, we have, I think it's, I think uh, Bob Burke is a sales guy, he has about 90 percent of the, uh, the districts in Florida covered by Central. 90 percent? 90 percent. So whether that's for uh, just a DVR or doing a video management. Oh, well, then, then that would be us too, then, right now. Yes. I, I'm, saying, I'm saying at the next level, at, at the level that we're talking about going here, how many rural. I'm, I'm, I could find the information, I could get that back to you. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can see this working well in an urban area where there's great cell signal and we got a lot of the ability to, to look in, but when we're out here in the rural area, that's why. The you, know, you know, just I'm just not so sure it's gonna we're gonna get the bang for the buck, but I I would be curious about that. Yeah. I remember the the, uh, the modem itself has the ability to kind of scan itself. I'm sorry, so what's that? So the modem actually has the ability to scan itself. So as signal strength goes down to the east, actually switch down from 5G to 4G to 3G, um, it will maintain service for whatever signal it is available. So we don't always need a, a perfect service, and this land suspension um, of the coverage over here is getting a lot. So this isn't just a 5G, 4G device. It'll actually go down to 3G if it's available. Yeah. <coughs> Additionally, we will bring back some um, information on what rural districts are utilizing this. But we did go and look and see what districts have Wi-Fi on their buses already. And we did see that Leon, Alachua, and Gulf counties, which have a good portion of their areas are rural, 
they have their buses outfitted with Wi-Fi. Ms. Androsky, do you have that slide um, that had the numbers on it? So one of the things, that was it, you actually had it. <clears throat> so the, you're saying to us though that with the, the, the loss of 3G, we are going to have to upgrade that uh, LMU equipment and the cost is about $95,000. What funding source would we use from that compared to what funding source we would be using on the second bullet. So for the LMUs, that's that's a capital expense. So that would come directly out of our just our capital budget, where the two hundred and forty-seven thousand is that grant funded then? Yes, that is from the technology assistance grant. So and that, has been that would not impact our our ad valorem tax dollars, but the one above it would. As far as then the, the bullet item number three, if that were to be considered either now or in the future, is that something that is funded at a grant or is that something we would have to actually look to budget? That is something we would have to explore and, and uh, see if we would work it into the budget or if we there are grant opportunities available to us for that one. But, but that wouldn't even be an option with the LMU equipment. So if though, we didn't do Wi-Fi connections on, on the bus, so let's say that bullet number two. But we did find ourselves in the position we're going to have to upgrade that LMU. I mean, I don't think that's probably, I, that's something we're going to be doing one, one point or the other in the next 12 months, I'm assuming. Can, will that still allow us to do the bullet item number three? No. You could not. So if we do that, we would not have the availability to have a turn-by-turn -turn GPS system for our substitute drivers or drivers in general. Correct, and you would not have the ability for the live look-in either with bullet number one. Okay, so the only way you get down to those level of, of safety features is to, to do with the bullet number two. Right. The, the router is the, the bullet number best feature of that is the amount of options it gives you. If we weren't using grant monies and we were finding ourselves in a position, is this still something, bullet number two, have, I'm saying if we were not even looking at putting Wi-Fi on buses, from a safety factor, is there validity in us looking at that bullet number two, regardless of how we would fund it or regardless of whether we put Wi-Fi. Because the Wi-Fi portion of it really is then just a factor of funding that through E-rate. And the continuing cost for the GPS is that subscription, which is $96 a unit uh, a year, is the same as what we're currently paying. We're already currently budgeting that in. So as far as just getting the hardware, the continuing cost is something that we're already we already are paying and have been paying. But the <coughs> to your to your answer, my just to give an example, my daughter is sitting there doing homework and she's you know, paper and pencil, she's doing math, and then she pulls out her tablet and I said, What are you doing? And she said, I'm not turning my homework. I said, What do you mean? She has to take a picture and then upload it, and that's how she has to turn her home. So a student that doesn't have Wi-Fi at home, the bus ride home gives him a chance to turn his home. Um, so your answer is, to me, technology is where we're going, and if you don't keep up with technology, it will leave you behind. So this is kind of getting, getting ahead of where technology is heading. No, and I and I see. I just I think that the Wi-Fi connection is what um, is a miss. Sometimes I understand it's been a motivator to help fund this, but if we didn't even provide a Wi-Fi connectability to students, there seems to be a lot of conversation about the the components, the safety components, the look-in, the the turn-by-turn. -turn that to me would 
would have validity whether we provided Wi-Fi or not. Yes. And, we're, and like Ms. Hemmel spoke about the shortages in other departments, driver shortage is not just interest county, driver shortage is, is statewide, nationwide. So that is another retained factor. That is the turn by turn is the best of what we're discussing today that goes out to our drivers, that helps our drivers. Now as far as the, the Wi-Fi and students detaching, that doesn't strain the driver either. It will be set up on at TRC level as far as the students' devices hooking up. Now if for whatever reason, which I have held the courts I can run to see if the Wi-Fi goes down on the bus, the driver might hear, Miss Jones, um, I'm sorry, but uh, the Wi-Fi is not working. So then she just reports it and then we go out and work on it. But as far as what's the Wi-Fi password, it's it's not going to be like at home. The driver doesn't have to deal with that. When the when the driver just cranks up the bus and she goes and drives her route, and when the, the child gets on, it's not an extra burden for the driver. It, this only will be beneficial to the driver. And there's been where when you have that Wi-Fi ability, um, it can also help the student management as well because it gives that. It gives those idle hands something to do. They can be on, and, and if they're doing on their tablet and they're working on the work, that's beneficial as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I see that as a great benefit. My concern is, are we are we buying something that's going to be actually be able to be used? Are we going to have the, the Wi-Fi? Are we going to have the ability, the cellular data ability to use all that? And so that's where my concern is because, and, and you just said, so if a kid says to the bus driver, hey, the Wi-Fi is not working. The bus driver is going to report that to you, and then you're going to send somebody out. I, I didn't quite follow you on that one, Nathan. Are you? As far as if, if, the, if the hardware on the bus is down, if we if we've got a wire shaped and we've blown a fuse. Okay, but what if they just don't have service? What if there's no? Uh, we can go out and do reports, like like Lance spoke on, and we can go out and find those weak spots within the county. Right, but is it up to, to is it up to the company Verizon or T-Mobile to? Set the net. I mean, Inverness. Have you driven through Inverness on Verizon? I mean, if the service is, is well, I just, I, I so, just so, tested you know, that. You know, know, so, how do you use Wi Fi? What's that? Go to T Mobile. Go ahead. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, I got yeah. T Mobile, and it, my, my sister in law works at uh, one of the schools, and uh, she's always saying, uh, you know, why don't I have cell phone service? And I said, well, it's, it's just a dead area with certain uh, vendors. But um, I have T-Mobile, and I can drive all around the hospital and everything, and I don't lose my my, six, my signal. I can I, you know, Right, but I'm the sure there's there's going to be dead spots with T-Mobile. I mean, unless you're standing up here saying there are none. I mean, if, no, if no, you're telling I, me that there's I, not going to be any to problems. Areas, but, um, yeah, it's it's improved drastically over the last few months. And when we sent those months. previous buses out, we did go to areas that are known to have poor cell coverage, and we were able to successfully broadcast them. So we went out to, um, I always say Duncan Field, South Citrus Ave. I know it's notorious, it's like Citrus Ave to, um, to the Bay Farms area, notorious for terrible cell service. And we were able to provide cell, inter you know, cell service to the students when they came to pick up their lunch. I believe we also sent a bus out to 12 t uh, Trail 10, right? Yes. And please understand, <coughs> the point of this is the connectivity out for, for our continuity plan and have the connectivity issue at different sites. We wouldn't park the bus at a site that didn't have wireless access. We would park the bus at a site that had it. The bus, if the, having the access to the network or internet while they're driving home is an added bonus. Our goal is to try to solve the connectivity for kids that don't have internet at their homes like we got into when we were in the pandemic the first time. We had no way of those kids uploading their information from under their iPads so they could go home and work with them. So if we had buses stationed at different places where we had, uh, where we were providing meals, those would be the same locations we would provide internet access where they could come out to the bus and have the internet access. We're getting into all the, what about this, what about that stuff that are added on packages to this. The point, the point of the continuity plan and the point of the package that we're, we're wanting to buy is to provide connectivity. Lance can address what up what the other, there are very few options we have, but Lance can address some of the other options that we have if we don't take an option 
to provide this connectivity. Right, and so with that, Mr. Mullen, I mean, that's the, the purpose, but really we're going to use all these other reasons to get it. I mean, I mean, the real purpose of the continuity plan is if something goes down, we've got to right. shut down again. But, you know, but what we're hearing is that if we do these things, we're going to have these extra services for, like, These bus. other things would be provided, right. would, be, would be available. We talked about the bus safety. We talked about the uh, having being, being able to look into the bus. There's a lot of things that would be available that won't be available on other ones if we did. If we just did the hot spots. And I think, Mr. Mullen, that's what we're just trying to do is find additional value so that in making that decision that we we can feel like it's it, while well, yes, the, the the catalyst for this is connectivity. I just don't want to get focused on. We're going to lose connectivity. We lose. We all lose connectivity. Right. You don't well, lose I, connectivity on your cell phone. Then you've got a better plan than I do. <laughs> We're all going to lose connectivity. We can't guarantee there's going to be access everywhere the bus drives. But the point of the project is to have connectivity available to students that don't have internet access at home. So we would make sure that we provide those buses a location where they would have that. So and Lance, if you would please address the other options. So that we have. The first two bullets are going to be required. The third bullet is the option, right? So the first bullet, we have to do that, yes. We, we have to utilize capital um, funds to do so. The second option is the one that the technology assistance grant uh, I submitted that's, for that. That's for the connectivity. Right, that's for the connectivity. And that would replace the equipment and negate the first bullet. The third one is is something that we could consider in the future, but I mean that's just saying if you replace the equipment with the router, then you have the ability to add on number three in the future, mm -hmm. but you do not with the LMU equipment. And we've got the grant for the, the the router. We have the grant for the second bullet. Yes, we do. Okay. Well, that yeah, I'm glad to clarify that because I thought you were using the grant for the third bullet too. Yeah. No. Okay. So the okay, so the grants only for the, the two hundred fifty thousand, and it would it would then we would have to pay the ninety five thousand. But Correct. you did you said Kathy that we would in explore a grant for the third bullet, but we might have to use budget. Right, we could explore that in the future. That's just we just wanted you to know that that is um, something that has been talked about over the years, and it's not something we currently can put in place, and it's not something we can put in place if we replace the LMU equipment. But if we go with the SRC router, then that is something we would have the ability to consider expanding upon going forward. And Lance, the SRC router, the the connectivity um, for each of those buses, for whether it's both the look-in the live look-in as well as the student access, that is that cost, which is I want to say roughly twenty-five thousand dollars or something like that, is I think the budget. Yeah. After um, that would that's that would be covered through E-rate. Yeah. <clears throat> currently, it's the uh, emergency um, connectivity fund that we pay for. It's part of E-rate. I go with E-rate. Yeah, so it's it's a portion of that, but that would not yeah. come out of then ad valorem taxing funding either. It would actually come out of that E-rate funding. Yeah, it comes out. Meaning, it, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's not coming out of capital. It's not coming out of operational. Yes. So it covers everything, but basically our monthly fee would be just over a thousand dollars for all of us. And that would be, and that's that cost that again would get covered through E-rate. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay, I've got a question for our State of the District presentation. Do you suppose that we can be done in an hour? <coughs> well, we also have WTC. I know that. I'm going to ask them next. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I'd like to give them the option to go first and then. Ours, yes, they can go before us at your pleasure if you're willing to do that. No, no, you no, all need to determine whether yeah. you want to stop for lunch, to come back, or whether you want to continue on. Okay. But if you'd like to get that job, you can go before us.
going to save some video copies of the time that you had time. Yeah. But we were invited here today to share with you um, programs at WTC that have come and go in the last 10 years. So first of all, I just wanted to give you a little basic information about how we go about offering new programs or ending programs, because this is not something that we do lightly. Um, there's a lot of information that we gather, a lot of meetings, a lot of talking and discussing before we either start a program or end a program. So as far as starting a program, um, some things that we look at is rec recognition of need in local regional workforce. Uh, that may come to us in the way of businesses giving us phone calls, people contacting you guys, um, and information getting back to us. So then we look into it, have some conversations. We look at the Department of Economic Opportunities Regional Command Occupation List. DEO breaks that down by state and region. We look at how, what the percentage of growth is, how many openings that they're looking at starting in the next five years. We also look uh, and have conversations with Career Source. They have uh, five target occupations or clusters that they focus on each year. If all those things look like it's uh, something that we should start or look into even deeper, then we get with local, local businesses, have them look at the Department of Education's curriculum, the certifications that would be offered, equipment needed, and job availability with our current, um, our local employers in that field. Another thing that is a big factor is, of course, instructor availability. Um, most of the people in the trades industries make quite a bit more than our educators, so it's sometimes difficult to find an instructor because they do make so much more money in the private industry. But if we find that right instructor, um, then that's just another step in the direction of offering the program. And then of course we have to look at funding that's available for startup. How expensive is the program? Is it a program that um, doesn't require a lot of startup costs? It may just be if we have computers available. Uh, is it a program that has a lot of equipment needs, such as like a program like welding or an aviation program that we're looking into currently? So those are the five or six things that we look at before we decide to move forward to start a new program. Any questions about those before I come to how we end a program sometimes? So, um, so under uh, influencing factors for ending programs, this is Powers. So obviously, first of all, we look at continued low enrollment. So if we have a program that over a three or four year period has been low enrollment, we're struggling to get students to be in that program. Um, we've done things like met with the instructor, we've met with people in the community, talked about the needs, um, looked at maybe some factors that are causing that low enrollment. Um, <coughs> then we go on to the fact that maybe we don't have an instructor. Um, then state and federal changes are what you asked about. Staggered programs. Staggered programs are the ones that the state says that they're ending. So, they, the state itself look, reviews our um, clusters and the instructional programs, the DOE curriculum each year. I mean, every three years we're here. Mm -hmm. Every three years they have a committee um, get together, and these committee members are instructors from all the technical colleges or even could be secondary instructors also from the high schools. And they get people in the business community also, and they look to see, is this program meeting the needs of our either regional or state occupational needs? If it's a program for maybe it's a, an industry that's going away. Uh, well, I've got a few examples on our list, but. So if the state, the state gives us three years to let us know that they're daggering that program, that that program is ending. So we have three years to phase that program out. And sometimes the state does that and just changes the type of program. So it's one example on here is a computer program that they said we don't need to teach it this way anymore. We need to add these other things. So they dagger that program, but then they change it and it becomes another program. So sometimes they just update changes in names, they update programs, and then sometimes the state will even change whether a program can be offered by us, because WTC as a technical college can only offer certificate programs. We cannot offer degree programs, but state colleges can offer both. Um, so sometimes the state will change. For example, a few years ago, we were working on getting ready to offer surgical tech a program. Um, it was in large demand, a need in our community. Um, as 
we were working on that. We found that the state was getting ready to make changes to go from it being a certificate program to a degree program. So at that point, we stopped. <laughs> didn't waste any more time because we knew we weren't going to be able to offer it in the future. And it is now a degree program. Any other questions on that part? How many people like us who are in the last of the WTC offering program to teach me how to do a quilt? So, you know, I, uh, you know, y'all don't, you just can't willy nilly. You know, um, we offer, we used to offer a lot of community ed programs. So, Ms. Powers was asking about phone calls like, now about offering a quilting class. Those are not Department of Education programs. Most of the ones we're talking about here are Department of Education programs. Um, but we used to offer a lot more community ed type classes like you're talking about. Yeah, leisure type program classes. Um, we really don't do much of that anymore, and neither do most of the technical colleges in the state. When we meet and discuss some of the things that we talk about, that's one thing that came up a few years ago, and most of the technical colleges have stopped doing most of them. Because of lack of demand, um, YouTube, everybody, they want to learn how to do something, they just YouTube it, they learn how to do it. So why do they need to come to a class and sit, you know, once a week for six weeks? So it's very rare. We do like a four-point class. Of course, we have our motorcycle class. It's still one of our leisure classes, but that's probably the two most popular. And the motorcycle is probably the one that is the only one that we keep going right away because of the need. So. Was the um, security guard program, I noticed you had on here quite a few years ago, was that was lack of enrollment or they changed the standards for that or how did that uh, get deleted? No, um, when, I don't know if Chief is listening, <laughs> yes. uh, mm -hmm. when I asked him about it, um, we talked about that. And it's still something that we can offer. It had more to do, right, Chief, um, with cert getting instructors with the certification or the cost? Yeah, there so it was too part. It was demand for the class. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of demand out there, but you also have to have instructors that are certified to teach that. Uh, recently, within the last year, we've worked on trying to get those instructors certified to teach the security PNG license again um, to, to do that. But uh, we haven't done that quite some time. But there really, in our area, there wasn't a big demand for that. Like, you know, the bigger towns like Hillsborough would have that operation. So. so that's not an FDLE course, obviously, no, but it's so, you, so the certification comes from what organization? Yeah, um, it's a DOE. Yeah. Oh, it's a DOE. Okay, thank you. You can probably have another one. So So the next part is just uh, a breakdown. Mrs. Davis did a great job of putting this on uh, a two-page format for us so that you can see all of our programs. So this is the programs that we have that we have offered uh, in the last 10 years, uh, starting in 2012. And as you go across, of course, if there's an X in every box from 2012 to 2021 22 that means that we have offered that program all these years and still are still offering that program and then there is an explanation on each line like the first one administrative office specialist we had it in 2012 up until 2017-18 in 17-18 when we say deleted the program we ended the program at wtc we took it off of our um uh, COE, which is our accrediting agency's matrix, because we have to have them listed on what programs that we are offering. Um, but it is a program if we ever wanted to go back and offer it, we could. It doesn't mean that we can never offer it again. But the reason that we ended that program was because um, the same instructor was also teaching medical administrative specialists. So if you scroll down and find medical administrative specialists, you'll see where um, that program picked up about that same time. So we had. Um, the teacher right here, the teacher um, was offering that program. So basically that was taking over. There were more students that were enrolling that wanted to take med medical administrative and not administrative office because basically it was the same course with the medical content. So we just got rid of that program because more students were taking medical administrative. So we didn't do away. We're still offering a similar program. It's just not that med um, administrative office program. Uh, HVAC. We still have cybersecurity with a new program we started um, a few years ago. And um, again, we went through all those steps that uh, we talked about in the beginning. Um, we had someone ask us about it. We checked into it, went through all those steps, and we started the program. And it is slowly growing. And as you know, there's a huge need for cybersecurity. Um, welding we've had the whole time. Automation and production technology, that is a program that was started in uh, 13, 14, I think. Um, but that was a program that was uh, started uh, 
It was one that uh, was a manufacturing, in the manufacturing cluster, but after four years, there just was not enough enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, so we ended that program. Auto Collision is a program that we've had um, for the last 10 years. Actually, Auto Collision is one of our um, first six that we had when we started in 1968. Um, but that is one, even though it's not on here, that's one that kind of brought some things up this year. That is a program at this point we will not be offering next year. Um, but we are not completely doing away with it. We are actually looking into doing maybe a part-time, kind of like what Mrs. Powers mentioned, a leisure community ed type class where it's um, maybe hobbyist that want to come in because we have the paint booth. So we want to be able to utilize that paint booth. So we're going to look for some way to utilize it and maybe do like a hobbyist class where some of these people that want to redo their own cars can come in and take some take class and utilize some of the equipment. Um, some people want to get the dance office and person who's doing a deep cleaning. They have a degree at a community college around sisters, but not in sisters. And there are other students just out there. I was wondering if they do that. Why do they choose that? I know they look at the night, but it's the kind of here. We don't offer that program. We have one thing to do at Doctor. This is Connors a few years ago when she was principal first for my joining with them. But mm -hmm. it's an extremely expensive program to start. Um, and getting instructors is very difficult too because again, what can they make in the industry versus being a teacher? Um, so it has to be the right instructor, it has to be someone who's worked enough years in the industry to ready to change their hours or change their workload and want to get back to their profession. So that is a challenging one to start. Um, auto service, we still have um, auxiliary law enforcement officer. I don't know if Chief Vincent wants to speak up about that again, but that is one that uh, we used to offer. It's not really anything, it's not a program that leads to our basic recruit class, so it wasn't very beneficial. Anything else you want to say about that? The, the, the last class we ran was, I think, 2016-2017 for Randall County Sheriff's Office, and the drawback about that certification is that it does nothing in that curriculum translates to being a basic recruit. So, <clears throat> it's just not a very in-demand type of certification. Most people want something that will translate into future education, and also um, is not that good. And I swear I've never that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Um, commercial Foods Culinary Arts is a program that we uh, still have and going strong. And we took a, a hit last year in, enroll, enroll, in enrollment due to COVID, of course. Um, but it has bounced back pretty quickly this year. And um, it is actually, if you look at PEO's um, demand occupation list, it is one of, the, um, one of the areas that is growing quickly that there's a huge demand for. So we hope to see that continue to grow. Computer systems technology, um, that is one of the ones like we talked about Ms. Mrs. Powers earlier. The state changed it, said that the computer systems technology program is not meeting the needs of technology as it's changing. They updated the program. They gathered computer systems technology, right? The same company, if I don't get the wording right, she does this more than I do. So um, it changed to technology support system, which if you look down the list, you'll see where we started that program. So we don't just, when the, when the state gathers that program, they tell us that we have three years that we know, and, and three years is going to end. So we do a teach out. So we finish those students that are in that program. We don't just leave them hanging. So we finish those students out. Any students that start new during that time, they would not start in the old program that's being gathered, the community, community, I can't talk, computer systems technology. They would start with technology support systems in the program. All right, correctional officer, cosmetology, crossover to law enforcement, and then crossover um, from corrections to law enforcement. Those are also going on. Early childhood education, um, before our time there, but my understanding was that there was a change by DCF on the training requirements. It used to be a course or a program that we offered that was about 600 hours, I believe, and the state or DCF made some changes where you only had to attend a class for 40 hours. So they basically changed that whole course. So we are that did not offered after that point. Um, electricity we still have going on. Firefighter. Um, Ended a couple years before, or a year or so before we uh, started WTC, but um, according to actually talking to Chief Vincent again about that one, lack of enrollment, um, it was been struggling for a few years plus. Citrus County um, County Commissioners had their own facilities, and so they have that program currently. 
industrial machinery and controls technician. That is a new program that we started this year. Um, we're thrilled up about starting that program. There's a huge demand for that. Um, and we um, got a DOE approved in October, and it is held approved now. So, um, yes. And actually, our instructor, um, Mr. Fasori, who's a new instructor that started with us last year, along with Mr. Worthay, our electricity teacher, um, wrote that curriculum and got it approved. So we're very proud of them. And we've had a lot of feedback from Career Source and Mr. Ma, which is a manufacturing association from Marion County. Um, and they are thrilled to have that in place because of the changes that we've had in our community the last couple of years with automation and distribution and um, uh, how that's going to grow with the Suncoast Parkway coming in. There is going to be a huge need for it. There already is. There's about 1,500 positions currently needed bill for uh, this type of maintenance person, um, but that's going to continue to grow. Industrial machinery and maintenance repair, that is a program that we ended back uh, a few years ago because basically there was still a need for it in our community, um, but we just could not find an instructor. We tried for over a year to find an instructor and could not. Law enforcement, of course, we saw for that. Massage therapy, medical administrative specialist. Uh, in the last two years, three years, we started medical assisting. This is our third year. Medical assisting is also another um, career in the state of Florida that is um, one of the top um, growing careers in the state. So that program has not been growing as fast as we would hope. We're working on some things to hopefully get it to go uh, grow a little more, but it is definitely in demand um, and is slowly growing. Medical code or biller is a, a need that we um, were informed about, so we started that program this year. And then now specialty. Now specialty we started a few years ago. Again, cosmetologists in the area got with us and talked to us about the fact that they were short nail technicians and um, we didn't have to start a separate program to do that one, so it was kind of easy to fit in because we already have the cosmetology program. It's part of the cosmetology program. It's how many hours there? One eight. So it's less than 200 hours, so they can come in there and be a part of the cosmetology program for those 200 or 180 hours and do just the nail portion if that's all they wish to do. So and that actually has been growing this past yes. year a lot. Um, we offer option, actually offering two of them this year, which in the last couple of years we've offered three. Three, three right. this year. All right, so we're offering three this year because we're getting ready to another. We're in the past we've only offered one. Um, Network Systems Administration we've been offering for all these years. So nursing assistant and patient care assistant, as you can see, if you look between those two, we've kind of gone back, uh, back and forth. We were offering both of them um, back in 12-13, and then we stopped offering nursing assistant for a few years because uh, hospitals, rehab centers, et cetera, were telling us that they needed um, employees with the home health and hospital uh, components, which is what the patient care assistant program offered and the nursing assistant program did not. So we did that, just that program, patient care assistant, for a few years. And then you'll see now we got rid of that program, went back to nursing assistant, again, because of the need in the community. And that's one thing that's hard for people to understand. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to offer math for the next 1,000 years. That's not what we do at WTC. There may be a, a field that we need to do for 10 years because it's growing, and then it may drop off, or it may change. And <coughs> five years down the road, it may come back a little different. So what, what is happening is now with nursing assistants, is that um, people did not want to come to class for as long because they could get hired. There's such a need for CNAs in the community that facilities were needing to hire them faster and wanted them through the program quicker. And even even, even that program um, with nursing assistants, we, we are struggling to keep that program going and we may not have it after this year if we can't do some things differently because there is such a need in the community that, as you know, I'm sure you've gotten plenty of phone calls about why don't we have this program, why don't we have that program, because there is such a shortage of employees in the workforce. Um, but the prop, that kind of leads to this problem. Because there is such a shortage, all these facilities are willing to hire people without certification. So if they're going to hire them without certification, guess what? They're not coming to school. They're not going to come to school to take a program if they can get hired without it and get paid the same. So that's kind of what's been happening in the last couple of years with nursing, excuse me, with nursing assistant. So it may be a program next year when we give you this updated list that won't be on there. Or have a, they don't have a delete by it. All right, to wrap up real quick, practical nursing. Um, we've had for several years private security officer. I was going to say anything else. I think Dave's already touched on those. Uh, why we don't have those type of programs as much. And then 
technology support systems is what we've had going on. So is the plan teachers based on the data uh, in the school system? Yes, ma'am. We are a district school. Our instructors get paid the same as every other teacher. Any other questions? Just that, I, you know, I, I so appreciate what you do. I, I don't think people really understand. You said, you know, we always hear in the community, well, why aren't they doing the, you have to operate as a business, and you can only operate one if you have, you know, students that are coming to your, your classes. I don't think most people understand how much you are regionally impacted to that regional, um, the regional demand occupations list really is a huge guide for you all in being able to say, well, I know that you might, you know, solar may be a big deal, but if there aren't jobs in this region, then that doesn't mean that you can necessarily just start a program thinking if you build it, they will come. And I, uh, I appreciate that because I know you are a, a great resource in our high school career and technical education conversations. You are always someone who, uh, has great insight and, and help when we we're talking about needs there because you're seeing the needs on the ground. And, and I, I think this is always a good gauge for us to then be able to talk in the community and say, you know, well, why, why did you guys do away with your CNA when you have 2,000 CNAs that you need in Citrus County? It's because they don't need to get a certification. And, and it's important to say we can't offer a course just to say we're offering. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. And just for note, because I know Chief Vincent mentioned it too about, um, I think it was a private security officer from the UNS about Mr. Dodd. Um, and we do look at that. We actually do a breakdown. Mrs. Davis does a sheet with each instructor each year, a budget sheet that looks at their enrollment and how we're funded with FTE dollars. And she sits down with every instructor every year and shows them where is your program at? You know, are you breaking even? Are we in the black or are we in the red? If we're in the red, what do we have conversations about? What do we need to do to increase enrollment? Or is it something we can even do? Can we do anything to increase enrollment because of the changes? So we do have these conversations with our instructor also. Um, and you're right, Mr. Kennedy, if I had a dollar for every time somebody called me and said, why aren't you starting? We have pest control. We have, um, I don't know. I, there's something I can't even think of. Small um, Every mm -hmm. meeting we have, you know, um, and, and you know, as much as we appreciate the smaller businesses around, if they're only hiring one person in that field or a couple people, we can't start a program just to, to supply employees for a couple of small businesses. It just doesn't work that way. We, we would never, um, our budget would have been taken away from us a long time ago if that's the case. But um, just to end on an exciting note real quick, we are in the process of looking at um, another new program. I know one of you mentioned when you were talking about the drones and aviation programs. And that is a program that we are looking into, um, airframe and power plant mechanics with the expansion of the highway, which the, with the expansion of the airport um, and some grants going on there. We're in the process of writing a grant um, to start at those two programs, airframe and power plant mechanics, which are in huge demand also in the state and in our region and will be um, even more available for people who live in Citrus County and have those uh, types of profession, if not in Citrus County, one of surrounding counties, but Tampa, Orlando, with the highway coming in. Um, so we're excited about that. Again, those that's one of those programs that's really expensive to start. We're looking at probably asking for around four million for this grant, so uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, but I know all the we had oh gosh four or five community business um, meetings so far about it, and. Um, the economic development groups in the area are very excited about it. So we Thank you bring for, that more to you soon. Yeah, that's that's good information to, to hear about. Um, you know, it was before COVID, we met with uh, Wright Letter Aviation here in, in Inverness at the airport. And I don't know if you've been in contact with Oh, we've been working very closely Yeah, yeah, with right. So, I mean, they were actually really interested in a aviation uh, aeronautics program, you know, and they've, they have several throughout the state that have been very successful. I think Timing-wise, this was not a good time period for that. But I'm glad to hear that you guys are working on that option. Yeah, yeah, we've been in close contact. We've had several meetings with them, but yes, they are. Um, with some of the expansion that they're getting ready to do is yeah. going to be very beneficial. So the pay is very, very high. The pay is very high. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is not fast to start though. Just to get FAA accredited as a flight, the flight one forty-seven school. 
takes about two years, 18 months to two years. Go ahead. We're very happy at a lot of details. Yes, exactly. And then the kids that are graduating with their certificates, are all of them being immediately employed uh, within our area? In any of our programs? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Most of the time, if somebody's not being employed, it's because they choose not to be employed. Yeah, that's we do have some students that go to school um, to go to school. Yeah. And I did have one of my students, he was a college bound student, and I had him as a 10th grader. But when I toured your school a couple of years ago, he was in your welding class, and he said, Miss Kath, I, I said, don't be disappointed, I'm just going for the money. <laughs> yeah. Money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Gloria. I appreciate Thank it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We need lunch. Can we come back after lunch? Um, or do we need to reschedule? Well, I'm, I'm leaving for my son's tennis match away at 2 o'clock, so I'll, I'll be... You won't I'll be here. Be, I'll be driving at that, too, so... It doesn't matter. Whatever your pleasure of the board is, just let us know. If you want us to reschedule, we can certainly do it at the March workshop, if you'd like to. Is there going to be a March workshop? There will be if we reschedule this. Which I can see. Oh, that's right. Did you say, Mr. Bennett? No? Yes. Uh, the last... No. Oh, it is. It's no. before spring break, isn't it? It's before spring break. Right. Right. Before yes, on the 22nd. Yeah. Yeah. March 22nd. Yeah. 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 We can discuss that board meeting if you like. But if you'd like us to move this to a different date, we can just bring it back to another meeting. Or another These people are going to go cry? No? Ah! Nobody's <laughs> crying? <laughs> no. <laughs> go ahead and cry. People are going to speak to I us. I think they're okay. Okay, good. good. Huh. All right, so we will reschedule. Thank you, sir. Thank you. But we do reschedule knowing that we're in a great state. Of hey, we'd like these guys to go first next time. Thank you. Yes. All right. Um, is there anything else? Okay. Well.